Good evening, everyone. I am going to call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order on Monday, May 8th. We will begin the meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. And on special occasions, we have the honor of having the colors presented by the Bloomington Police Department Honor Guard. And the special occasion tonight is that we are recognizing National Police Week and Police Officers Memorial Day, as well as Respect for Law Week and the presentation of the Officer of the Year Award. So I will turn it over to Police Chief Booker Hodges. All right, please rise for the To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. So thank you to the Honor Guard and thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Um, and thank you for those watching online. Our first item of business is the approval of the agenda. And so on tonight's agenda, um, after approval, we have a couple of introductory items. So we have three pro proclamations, as was mentioned, one for National Police Week and Peace Officers Memorial Day, one for Respect for Law Week and Officer of the Year Award. We have a proclamation for Tennis Month. We will then um, have an introduction of new employees in a presentation on Resilient Communities Project. After that, we will move on to our consent business. Uh, Council Member Mua has that. And then we have no hearings and resolutions tonight. And we have a couple of organizational business items. Uh, 5.1 is our neighborhood traffic management program update and then a public safety update, followed with our city council, city council policy and issue update. So with that, I would move approval of the agenda if there are no changes. Second. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, motion passes 4-0. All right, so the first item on our agenda, I have a lot of papers up here, so you'll have to forgive me, um, is the proclamation for National Police Week. Um, and so I am going to come down to the podium along with uh, Chief Hodges, I believe, and I will read the proclamation. Make sure I have all of them. <laughs> Make sure I do not read the Tennis Month proclamation. Okay, is this on? Okay, great. Uh, so I'm gonna read the proclamation for National Police Week, which is May 14th through 20th, 2023, and National Peace Officers Memorial Day, which is May 15th, 2023. Whereas there are more than 800,000 sworn law enforcement officers serving in communities across the United States, including the dedicated members of the Bloomington Police Department. Whereas assaults and assaults with injuries against law enforcement officers are reported each year, the average per year total for both is 55,054 and 16,260, respectively. And since the first recorded death in, 19, in 1786, over 23,000 law enforcement officers in the United States have made the ultimate sacrifice and have been killed in the line of duty. The names of those dedicated public servants are engraved on the walls of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. 
And whereas, according to preliminary data compiled by the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, 226 officers were killed in the line of duty in 2022. This is a decrease of 61% from the 586 officers killed in the line of duty in 2021, which was the highest total line of duty officer deaths since 1930 when there were 312 fatalities. The decrease from 2021 to 2022 is driven largely by substantial reductions in COVID-19 related deaths. And whereas the service and sacrifice of all officers killed in line of duty are honored annually during the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Foundation Candlelight Vigil. The 35th annual Candlelight Vigil will take place on Saturday, May 13th, 2023. And whereas the first recognition of National Police Week and Peace Officers Memorial Day was signed by President Kennedy in 1962. It was resolved by Congress that May 15th be designated Peace Officers Memorial Day to honor all the fallen officers and their families and the week in which it falls be designated as Police Week. And whereas, in honor of Police Week and Peace Officer Memorial Day, the Bloomington Police Department will join the Minnesota Law Enforcement Mor Memorial Association on May 15th to stand guard at the Peace Officer Memorial in St. Paul, followed by the attendance of a remembrance ceremony at 7 p.m. on May 15th. And therefore, I, Acting Mayor Jenna Carter, do hereby proclaim May 14th to May 20th as National Police Week and May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day in the city of Bloomington and publicly salute the service of law enforcement officers in our community and in the communities across the nation. And I will turn it over to Chief Hodges. Um, before I do that, I will just say thank you for your service and thank you so much to the service of Bloomington police officers. Um, just this last weekend, we heard of another um, officer who was killed in the line of duty in Wisconsin. And I think that makes five in Minnesota and Wisconsin just within a very short period of time. And so um, most of us go to work every day not having to worry about whether we're going to make it home to our families at night. Um, and so just really grateful for all of the sacrifice and the commitment that police officers across the country and especially in Bloomington, um, you know, really put on the line for us every day. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chief Hodges. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you for the proclamation. Um, as chief, I always say I'm fortunate enough to have the best chief job in the country. Um, I worked with some of the best human beings on the face of the earth and the 123 Bloomington police officers and all of our record staff and dispatchers do everything they can every day to ensure that our communities are safe. And uh, every time we put on this uniform, we tell the public that our life is less important than yours. And I can assure you that all of our officers are grateful for the support that we receive here in the city of Bloomington. And as we go into police week, let's just not let us forget that there are a lot of us uh, police officers who don't get to go home to their families, protecting the public. And those, those are the ones that we're talking about that are just killed. Um, there's a lot of police officers that don't go home physically and mentally the same way they left at work in the morning. So I just want to thank every last one, the people that put on this uniform. Uh, like I said, my job is easy. The cops that work for me, their job is hard. So I just, I'm grateful for that. So with that, I'll step aside. Thank you, Chief Hodges. Um, our next proclamation is for Respect for Law Week and the Officer of the Year Award. So I'm going to read the proclamation, and then we have Bloomington Optimist Club President Arlen Grusing here, um, along with Chief Hodges, obviously, um, to accept the proclamation and then say a few words and introduce the Officer of the Year. All right. And this one is fancy because we get to give it away. Um, okay, so I'm going to read this proclamation for Respect for Law Week. May 14th through 20th, 2023. Whereas crime and its effect upon the lives and property of our citizens is of utmost concern, and the continued efforts of our local government, citizen organizations, and individuals to curb this problem is greatly appreciated. And whereas the problems of crime touch and affect all segments of our city and can undermine and erode the moral and economic strengths of our communities and their citizens if unabated. 
And whereas public awareness and determination to maintain the faith in the preservation of law and order and the appreciation of the importance of law enforcement officers and their roles in preserving social order in a democracy is everyone's responsibility. And whereas Optimist Clubs and their members continue to sponsor and support programs aimed at combating crime and respecting law through year-round efforts. And whereas each year, the Bloomington Optimist Club presents a Respect for Law Officer of the Year Award to an exemplary Bloomington Police Department officer, excuse me, who speaks to the professionalism and core values of the department. Respect demonstrated through our compassionate and honest service. Whereas, the Bloomington Optimist Club is honored to present the 2023 Respect for Law Officer of the Year Award to Officer Desmond Daniels. Officer Daniels is a 15-year veteran police officer and has been employed with the BPD for the past four years. Officer Daniels will receive his award and be recognized for his service at an upcoming honorary event. Therefore, I, Acting Mayor Jenna Carter, do hereby proclaim the week of May 14th through 20th, 2023 as Respect for Law Week. All right. If you want to... Join me up here. Up too, yeah. Yeah. And if, <laughs> if any of you, either, all of you want to say a couple words, that'd be great. I'll let Arlen speak first. <laughs> Thank you very much for the proclamation. We do this annually, and we have for over 30 years. And it's uh, extremely important to us, the Optimus Club, to support our police department. We have a dynamite police department in this community thanks to the leadership, and it's been going on for many years. I used to play ball with a lot of the people. They're old like me. They're not here anymore. <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, I just want to uh, take this chance to thank the city for honoring the police. And after the last four years, we can't speak that loud enough. And by the way, the Optimus Club is doing well. The, uh, we're having our banquet on Thursday. And we'll celebrate. And we're also going to add one celebration this year to that one. The Firefighter of the Year. That's also there. Plus our oratorical contest winners, plus our essay contest winners. So we've got a lot of people that we got to thank. And uh, the Coupe de Gras is a respect for law because it's so long and standing. So uh, we also had an Easter egg hunt a little while ago. We had over 1,000 people. And uh, the only thing that bothered us, we had to <laughs> collect a lot of goose droppings before we could put the eggs down. <laughs> so we may have to send a bill to the city for cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> then we also have the fishing contest coming up for Bush Lake on uh, June 3rd. And uh, so we're doing well, meeting at mugshots on a weekly basis. Uh, so thank you very much. Appreciate your help. Congratulations, I'll thank do it you. again formally. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You want to say nothing? I sure. just want to say thank you and <laughs> officers. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and myself and officers at the PD really appreciate the support from the city. Hold on, you don't get to leave yet. <laughs> um, so, Officer Daniels, this is he. He, you know, he's being bashful. This is a big deal uh, to get the Officer of the Year Award for the Police Department, and the work that he did to get this. Um, it was good work, right? And it, it's it's work that, um, you know, in law enforcement that sometimes people don't want to do in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that we have a fair, we're treating people fair and equitably and our workplaces are, uh, you know, reflective of the community and making sure that we're all together um, and really getting out there in the community. Um, it's work that is valuable. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's work that, makes our community safe. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you. All right, you all thought I was done, but I'm not. Um, I have one more proclamation to read. It is National Tennis Month, May 2023. Whereas the United States Tennis Association has declared the month of May as National Tennis Month to encourage players, organizations, facilities, retailers, tennis manufacturers, and more to promote local programs and activities at parks and facilities to showcase tennis and spread the word about the sport and its benefits and to help players and non-players alike find courts and play opportunities in their communities. <clears throat> and whereas... 
The latest research by the Physical Activity Council shows that more than 23.6 million Americans played tennis in 2022, an unprecedented 33% increase in participation over 2019, and the highest number of players since the study began in 2007. And whereas the City of Bloomington proudly partners with local tennis programs to showcase the important health, social, and educational benefits of tennis and to make the sport available to everyone, regardless of age, environment, condition, or ability. And whereas the City of Bloomington offers tennis programming options for youth and adults, thus increasing the accessibility of tennis for citizens of all ages and ability, which has contributed to making our community happier and healthier. And whereas the city is offering a free National Tennis Month celebration event at the Valley View Tennis Courts on Thursday, May 20th from 3 to 5 p.m. to continue to promote healthy, active lifestyles within the community. Therefore, I, Acting Mayor Jenna Carter, do hereby pro proclaim May 2023 as National Tennis Month in Bloomington and encourage all residents of Bloomington to become aware of and support tennis and tennis programming in our community. All right, with that. Oh, I'm sorry. I, w I didn't have it. I wasn't looking at my notes very closely. You can tell I don't usually do this. So you want to join me up here? Sure. All right, great. Hello. Uh, so I'm Recreation Supervisor Evan Hubbard for the city. Uh, I run sports primarily. Uh, I have uh, tennis coordinator Marsha Bach with me. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for your support of the proclamation and your support of recreational programming and Parks and Rec as a whole. Um, it's really appreciated. And uh, secondly, it would be incredibly unjust if I were to be the one standing up here talking about tennis when we have Marsha Bach on staff who has been actively involved with or participating in tennis programming in the city for over 50 years. So uh, I'm going to step aside and let Marsha do what she does best, which is talk about tennis. Thank you, Evan. He's actually my mixed doubles partner, and we make a great team because everyone lobs me, and Evan can grab the ball. Um, before I start, I, I would like to say thank you to the Bloomington Police Department. I've been a, a resident of Bloomington for over 50 years, and we do have the best department in the state, so thank you. And City Council, Acting Mayor, thank you so much for the proclamation acknowledging National Tennis Month in the City of Bloomington for the month of May. We are one of hundreds of communities across the country who will be celebrating tennis this month. The USTA is committed to supporting our local parks and recreation department in this effort. The free National Tennis Month event Again, is Saturday, May 20th from 3 to 5 p.m. at Valley View Courts. Games, music, prizes, fun, open to all ages. We're encouraging all of you to come and families to try tennis. The equipment will be provided, and we will also be able to promote the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Summer Tennis Program at that time. <clears throat> Our tennis program is one of the best in the state with our adult men's, women's, and mixed doubles leagues, as well as a women's tennis ladder. We also collaborate with the USTA Northern Tennis in Your Park Adult Tennis Lesson Program. And new this summer, we're going to be partnering with Tennessee to offer youth tennis programs. Tennis continues to grow in participation, as you heard, and a recent study indicates that tennis players live, get this, an additional 9.7 years longer than sedentary individuals. Tennis ranks highest among all sports. Thank you so much for your time and continued support of the Bloomington Recreational Sports Programs. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item on our agenda is item 2.4, which is introduction of new employees. And I think I'm turning it over to Melissa, Ms. Mandershide. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. 
Uh, Mayor and Council, I am excited tonight to introduce you to three of our most recent hires in the city's legal department. Um, we have two of them in person and one of them on the uh, WebEx. There she is. Uh, we're going to start with Jennifer Cross as she's making her way up to the podium. Um, I'll say a couple of comments. Uh, Jennifer recently, um, well, Jennifer's been with us for a long time and she'll tell you about that, but um, she was recently promoted to the deputy position of our uh, civil division. Um, you can stand back there. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, excuse me, of our criminal division uh, and uh, and is uh, working on um, doing some staffing up for us as we head into um, uh, an always busy season. I was going to say into our busy season, but it's always busy. So um, we are exceptionally excited to have Jennifer uh, leading that division and uh, just um, for your frame of reference, that is one of three divisions. We have a criminal division, a civil division, and a compliance division. So with that as an introduction, Jennifer. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here. As Melissa said, I'm Jennifer Cross. I am now the deputy city attorney for the criminal division. I started with Bloomington almost 11 years ago. It will be 11 years on May 14th. Um, and I had been working as a prosecutor up until the end of March when I gratefully accepted this uh, promotion. I am so pleased to continue to be working with um, some of the longer tenured people at the city. Um, a couple of the other prosecutors have been here for a long time, longer than me, um, and we have a wealth of experience there. And I'm excited to be bringing on um, some additional staff. We are um, hiring a, a prosecutor position that's been posted, and we have two temporary employee positions that have been posted as well. So we are furiously uh, reviewing applications and conducting interviews there. I also, in addition to my prosecutor role that I had previously, get the privilege of working closely with the Bloomington Police Department and their command staff, um, which is a wonderful addition to uh, my tasks here at the city. Yeah, I appreciate your time very much, and I uh, also am very grateful for the promotion. Thank you. We're super grateful and lucky to have Jennifer with us. You probably recognize Jennifer because she's been before you, um, having received many awards that we've honored her for. So <laughs> um, we're super excited. The next person I'd like to introduce is Nick Redmond. Uh, he is on the civil team. The director or the the deputy of the civil team is Peter Zuniga, who I know you've met before. Nick has been with us for about uh, three months. Yep. Uh, and um, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about his background as well as the departments that he uh, works with. All right. Thank you, acting mayor uh, members. My name is Nick Redmond. I'm an assistant city attorney um, and I work in the civil division. The departments that I primarily work with are public works, IT, finance, and community services. So a lot of contracts. Um, and I received my JD and my master's in environmental health from the University of Minnesota. And before that, I got my bachelor's in history and classics from the University of Utah. Um, before joining the city, I was with Stoll Reeves um, as a, an associate attorney. I worked in environmental compliance and uh, natural resources. And before that, I was a judicial law clerk with the 4th District um, here in Hennepin County, um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. If you ever have a moment with Nick, I encourage you to ask him about his time during uh, COVID um, when he clerked. It was There's some extraordinary stories. <laughs> um, the last, uh, but certainly not the least, is Erin. She's joining us by WebEx tonight. Erin uh, has been with us for several months. I don't remember exactly how many months, but um, she reports to Jennifer. Uh, and uh, among the tasks that Erin does is open cases and assist with calendaring. And um, we regularly receive amazing feedback from our uh, callers about the great and kind uh, service that she provides when people call in. And people rarely call the legal department with good news. And uh, and so we often talk to folks um, who are having a tough day, a uh, tough year, a tough week. And Erin um, has been, no one, uh, it's been passed along to me that she's really delivered some excellent uh, customer service. Her official title is office assistant. Um, and with that as an introduction, I'll turn it over to Erin. Hi, my name is Erin Hutner. Um, I don't have much. I'm the newest on the legal team. Um, I've been here about three months. 
and I have a background in criminal justice and that's about it. I'm happy to be here and learning a lot. It's a great team to work with. Thank you, Erin. Thanks for joining us tonight by WebEx too. Our folks, Erin uh, is a part-time position. She's one of the recent hires that we had um, that are part-time positions as we continually work to find the right number of staff that we need in legal. Uh, our cases are going up, as I tell Jamie all the time, um, and uh, um, and we are actually bringing on some additional folks to help us open cases so that we can keep up with um, with the flow. Um, crime is down in Bloomington, but our cases are going up in that we have um, uh, more inputs coming in. So, Well, thank you, Ms. Manerscheid, and... Thank you, Jennifer, for continuing to choose Bloomington, and welcome to Nick and to Erin. Um, really appreciate that you, I mean, you could choose many employers, I'm sure, from ac across the state and the country, and the fact that you chose Bloomington uh, really speaks volumes, and, and we really appreciate it. Okay, so next we are going to have a presentation on a resilient communities project um, and specifically related to a development impact analysis and so we have Mr. Johnson up here for uh, a senior planner here from Bloomington and then I think you are probably going to be joined by some guests if I'm not mistaken. Good evening Acting uh, Mayor Carter and members of the council so I'm pleased uh, to be here with you this evening it's uh, nearing the conclusion of a, uh, a long process of some intensive research and work uh, excellent work on the part of some uh, University of Minnesota Humphrey School graduate students. So they're going to present you their preliminary findings here this evening. Uh, just by way of background, the Resilient Communities uh, Project is a University of Minnesota program that partners local and regional governments uh, with university faculty and students, mostly at the graduate level, um, on a wide variety of different projects that advance uh, community resiliency, equity, uh, and sustainability. So last fall, the City Council authorized uh, Bloomington to pursue a partnership with Resilient Communities. I uh, was added to the Planning Commission work plan, and uh, three projects were matched. We were very happy uh, for that, and this one presented to you this evening is the Community Development Project, uh, and it's focusing on two main areas. Uh, the general question wanted to be just an evaluation of uh, city investment uh, in development in Bloomington, and what is the city receiving uh, for that uh, physical and human and uh, financial investment. Uh, and the, the question itself kind of spun out in two main directions. One was an evaluation of mixed-use development, mostly through a return on investment uh, lens. Uh, and the second question, uh, which sponsored another capstone team, uh, has to do with uh, this, the city's investment in affordable housing. So we're going to bring up both uh, student teams here uh, for you to present their preliminary findings after uh, the presentation, they are going to issue a formal report at the end of the month, and that will be much more detailed about their methodology as well as all the data um, uh, that includes all of the, all of the information. Uh, and uh, we will make sure to get that to you and all the, advi the relevant advisory boards and commissions uh, as soon as the formal reports are published. So the way we'll run it is mixed-use team first. If you have any questions for them, uh, feel free to jump in, and then we'll invite our affordable housing team uh, to make their presentation as well. Okay, mixed use team. Thank you. Got that? Yep. Ready? Ready? Intros. <clears throat> oh, I'm I am Brian Call. Linnea Gatterstead. Max Wolosi. And I'm Alex Menke, and we are uh, all second-year graduate students at the University of Minnesota uh, getting our master's degree in urban and regional planning, and this is our uh, capstone project that we are happy to present to you all today. Alrighty. So uh, up here you can see our key question, and um, just to provide a bit of, a bit of context around this, um, we just want to address that residents rely on mus municipalities to provide services and maintain infrastructure, while municipalities have that responsibility to provide those services. Uh, and that requires a well-managed budget um, evaluating your revenue and expenses. The city of Bloomington wanted us to investigate and compare the financial costs and benefits of different development types, particularly mixed use, since that has been a um, 
increasingly developed uh, land use type within the recent years. To note, mixed use can be interpreted in a couple of ways, and we looked at uh, two main ways when we were evaluating this project. There is uh, mixed use in the sense of a standalone building with uh, commonly thought of as you know retail or commercial on the first floor and then residential above. And then at a district level, it can be single use buildings that are adjacent and just have different usage types. So we evaluated both uh, within this study. So based on um, our research topic, there is a really broad perception that uh, more dense development is more expensive to maintain um, and is a source of less revenue than lower density developments. Um, and part of this project was to explore the accuracy of that perception. Uh, Bloomington is a more or less fully developed city and uh, new growth has come from redevelopment and infill, which is primarily mixed use and higher density. So um, we have <clears throat> the mixed use developments uh, in the city have been primarily in three main areas, uh, Normandale Lake, Pen American, and uh, Bloomington Central Station or in the South Loop area. So uh, for this project, we uh, evaluated this you know, key question here, are mixed use developments a financial benefit or a financial cost for the city? And we conducted a uh, extensive literature review, reviewing over 40 um, research papers and articles to um, about have a good uh, understanding. Uh, revenue, subsidy, and expense analyses, uh, c coming up with methodology to find the most accurate way to uh, evaluate the cost benefit. And uh, also uh, interviews with pr uh, various practitioners uh, to get some more contextual information there. So before we dig into the specifics of the uh, the study, we do want uh, our team did find an answer to the above question, and that is that mixed use development is a clear financial benefit and has potential to greatly increase social, uh, equitable, and environmental benefits as well. Alrighty. So for the literature review, while we all read. Uh, the articles and provided input. Brian uh, did an amazing job of synth synthesizing all that data and uh, putting it together well. So uh, from a municipal expenses side, density and mixed use development reduce per capita costs of municipal services. And uh, from municipal revenue, density and mixed use development increase per, cap per capita municipal revenue. Additionally, research indicated that mixed use development can improve social equity but that is only when equitable, uh, when equity uh, building and anti-displacement policies are at the forefront of a development project. By having those as a keystone, the city can ensure that they aren't displacing anyone, actively participating in uh, gentrifying projects. And uh, Bloomington is uh, already has the Opportunity Housing Ordinance, which is a great step into this uh, measure. So up here, you can see uh, a 3D map of the city of Bloomington that shows tax revenue per acre by land use. Um, this is a lot to look at, but we have, we're very proud. And Max uh, over here is the brains behind this absolutely amazing map. Um, so as you can see, the higher the bar is the uh, higher the tax revenue per acre. And so the majority of the revenue is coming from the northern corridor along 494 and American Boulevard. Um, and you can see mixed use areas like South Loop, Pan American, Normandale Lake are even more noticeably jutted up there, um, especially compared to the uh, low density residential uses, which take up a large area of the city. And here, uh, this is a just another way to interpret that previous image. So this is a graph showing the percent of tax revenue versus the uh, percent of land use or area by land use type. So tax revenue is in yellow and land use or taxable land is in green. And uh, shows that low density residential takes up about 60% of the taxable land in the city of Bloomington and provides just over 30% of the tax revenue, while at the other end, mixed use takes up just over 2.5%, but provides thir over 13% of 
the tax revenue for the city. So the mixed use land uses are the highest prop property tax revenue producers um, compared to the amount of land that they occupy. Now I'll kick it over to Linnea. Can I just use this one? Okay. Uh, and so we we did quite a bit of citywide analysis, as you can see. And then we also wanted to dig in a little deeper. So we chose three case study sites that were kind of our control because they were lower density um, development, sort of typical traditional single family home was their kind of primary, primary land use. And we kind of use those as a control and then set the mixed use districts against them. And so as we kind of just compared um, different costs and revenues. And so um, Reynolds Park, the one furthest west, was the newest area. It has the lowest density development, developed most recently. Um, Normandale uh, Highlands was another uh, control district that we selected. This one is denser and has some higher density housing in addition to single family homes. And then Valley View um, was another study area that we selected. Um, it was developed more in the 40s and 50s, has the smallest lot sizes. And so we chose these because they had a kind of a different range of development styles and time periods. And we wanted kind of a range of, of, of development represented in our control group. So we can go ahead to the next one. So we wanted to pull out the same kind of mapping, um, looking at just in depth at these districts that we selected. Again, maps. Max put these uh, amazing maps together. Again, the bars on the map represent the property tax per acre. So the taller the bar is, the more efficient um, revenue per acre is being generated by the parcel. Yellow, again, is single family home only, as you can kind of see on the key there. Um, and again, you can see that the denser residential and the non-residential uses are generating more revenue per acre than the lower density um, residential uses are. We can go to the next slide. Um, and then here you can see the mixed use areas. Um, and then uh, again, gold is mixed use, office is purple, brown and red are the high density residential and the commercial. Um, and the tallest revenue per acre when you zoom in on these are often office, um, especially in Normandale Lake and uh, uh, Bloomington Central Station. Um, and then uh, you can see, um, we can point out a couple buildings on these. You can see the um, indigo and the Fenley are the two kind of bars in the center there that are the tallest right next to the super, super tall bar. The super tall bar, if anyone is wondering, is the Riverview office um, tower. So it's just interesting getting a look at what some of these buildings were. Again, you can see at Normandale Lake, um, a lot of the office towers are really high just in terms of revenue per acre. And so we thought this was an interesting um, just kind of zoom in on these um, districts. Uh, in previous studies, um, we found during our lit review, uh, mixed-use developments had revenues about 10 times higher than single-family developments. Uh, our analysis found the difference was about six times higher um, when we took the revenue per acre of these mixed-use districts versus our control lower-density districts. This is an analysis that our team member Brian ran. Those were our findings. Um, so we can go to the next slide. We also analyzed comparative expenses. Um, we did a budget analysis, and of the city budget line items, we focused on street maintenance, or the city sort of budget areas. We focused on street maintenance spending because we could allocate that cost geographically more confidently. So on the left, you can see cost per acre of, main t of annual street maintenance in each study area. This was an average, so the average um, annual road maintenance per acre. And on the, the lighter green is the um, mixed use areas and the darker green is the um, control lower density areas. So uh, the mixed use areas had a higher cost per acre largely because they had higher traffic, wider roads. Our methodology was kind of pricing pavement. They had more pavement, so they cost more per acre to maintain. On the right, you can see the annual road maintenance per capita. Again, now this is flipped. So the lighter green bar shows that the mixed use area, there's lower road maintenance costs per capita than there are in the lower density areas in the dark green. Um, so it, our findings uh, were that when considering population density in each study area, the cost per capita for denser mixed-use development was a little lower on average than um, it was for lower density development. Uh, unsurprisingly, the highest population density areas when you looked at the individual study areas were the ones that were the lowest cost. So those ended up being Normandale Lake, Brooklyn Cent Central Station, and then actually Normandale Highlands was just a little denser because they had quite a bit of high-density housing in the, in the study area that we drew. Um, another important fact that we want to point out here um, is that the three mixed-use areas will likely continue to see significant development, um, and the revenue for those mixed-use areas will continue to increase while the overall expenses will stay 
relatively flat and expenses per capita will come down since a lot of the infrastructure is already built. So we thought this is an interesting look that kind of showed that population density can create efficiencies for some types of city services that do reduce expenses per capita. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So our broad takeaways uh, from our analysis are that mixed use development does pay its way um, versus from a cost versus revenue standpoint, looking at it financially. The literature in our analysis were pretty clear on this point, um, that dense mixed use development um, in terms of vertical mixed use and in terms of mixed use districts were good for a city's financial stability. Um, we also found that effective mixed use development requires support. The literature and interviews with practitioners both identified government support and direction as a key factor in successful mixed-use developments and districts. Um, tax increment financing is an efficient source of subsidy. TIFs districts are a self-contained financing source. The city facilitates the subsidy, but it does not uh, provide any actual funds, which makes it a very efficient way to subsidize development. Um, there are non-financial benefits to mixed-use development as well. Uh, mixed-use development, as we said earlier, is environmentally friendly and can create strong social places for city residents. Um, it seems there is a clear market for mixed use development in Bloomington and continuing to create higher density housing um, styles will add to and complement the existing housing stock in the city and as well as add economic and cultural vibrancy to the city. Um, and our kind of final point is mixed use development is not the ultimate problem solver. Context and process are key to ensure the benefits of mixed use development are fully realized. Local context must be considered. Equity must be centered in policy and in the planning and development processes. Um, we can go to the next slide. And uh, that concludes our presentation. We want to thank Bloomington City staff and the council and acting mayor for inviting us today. Um, as Nick said, our full detailed report will be made available in a couple weeks and that will be sent out to everyone. And um, we are here for questions for a few minutes if anybody has any. Well, thank you all for coming tonight and for all of the work that you did on this. Uh, I personally think it's very cool and very <laughs> helpful information, especially as you know we're out in community and we get a lot of questions around some of the mixed use development projects and um, just the value that they provide to residents across the city. Uh, and so very, very helpful. I will say I love the map. And immediately I saw it and I was like, what? Because I didn't look at the key. And I was like, there's no way that buildings can be that tall by the airport. <laughs> <laughs> but um, really, really liked it. Uh, and then I did have one quick question. Actually, I have two questions, one for you all and then probably one for Mr. Verbrugge. Um, You stated that building and anti-displacement policies were necessary when you, like a necessary um, uh, thing to do um, in your literature review. And I guess I'm just curious if you recall what specific policies those were. Inclusionary zoning was certainly one. Um, I think I would also say just general subsidy and support for affordable housing and a mix of incomes in housing development. Um, you know, and I, there are lots of policies that can encourage that, but that was the main thrust of a lot of what we read. And I don't know if anyone else has other thoughts about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think also additionally, um, being centered around different uh, transit options as well was a, another way to promote um, mm -hmm. equitable distribution. Thank you. Uh, and then I guess my second question, Mr. Verbrugge, is uh, now that we have this information, does staff have a plan for how we're going to share or what exactly we'll do? Sure. Acting Mayor, Council Members, uh, with your permission, I'd like to invite Mr. Johnson back up uh, to the podium to talk about uh, what follow-up staff may have in mind as a result. Thank you, Mayor Carter. Uh, thank you, Manager Verbrugge. Yes, yeah, certainly we were going to uh, widely distribute and market uh, the report to share it with lots of different parties uh, so they can certainly generate some of their own conclusions and get it in the hands of policymakers. But we as staff uh, want to dig deep into the report, figure out which uh, recommendations are uh, most actionable, and see how we can incorporate some of those threads into future work plans for either planning commission or other boards and commissions. Um, on the point about displacement, I know this is kind of uh, moving through community development and potentially uh, to uh, EMT uh, eventually as well, but potentially maybe to your uh, desk at some point, but we are working on a, a business displacement. Um, I know that or, uh, a retention policy, I think is the term we want to focus on <laughs> as opposed to displacement, but um, yeah, that's something that we're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Congratulations on your uh, work here. Um, <clears throat> I, too, love the map. Um, big fan. Uh, so so one of the things we know, and I don't, I, this is just a, in case you have the opportunity to, 
to consider this as as either follow on items or if you had considered it in the report, um, the using um, the road maintenance question as your lever against expenses makes a lot of sense for the reasons that you mentioned. I will say that um, a contrasting measurement would be services, especially fire and police. And I say that for Bloomington specifically because they're the largest line items in our budget, uh, and it would be really helpful to understand how they may be having a um, adverse effect, if you will. Um, uh, not that I not that I'm saying this explicitly, but um, if I'm mapping the places where I know our police folks spend most time, it's interesting. The overlay on your map is fairly consistent. And so um, I don't know if you have the opportunity to do that or maybe you did, but if, if you did, great. If not um, understood, I just wanted to get that context. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, Acting Mayor and Council Member uh, D'Alessandro. Uh, that is a great question. We did discuss and look into that quite a bit. Um, we we found that there wasn't there wasn't a geographic map of police calls or incidents that could be shared with our team in any event. I think that would be an interesting question. We did actually look into a little bit about how does population uh, influence. Um, police staffing levels say, and, and the, the answer we got back from the police department was it does influence it, but it's also more complicated and it's a little bit contextual. And so there wasn't a great way, there wasn't a great way for us to allocate costs geographically in a way that we felt uh, confident about um, without making a lot of assumptions and without lacking a lot of data. And I think when I, when I hear that comment, one question I have is I, I wonder if the same kind of thinking about kind of per capita could be applied you know, if you were looking at police calls and seeing police calls in a in a certain area, I would wonder what the population density is of that area, and that would be a question that I would ask when trying to think about that question. But thank you for asking that. It is it is something we did look into and wrote a bit about in the report, but unfortunately weren't able to come up with a methodology we felt confident about to like truly map and truly like you know tie amounts to parcels or to to regions. Sure. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. And. Um it might be something we can follow up on internally now that we know the methodologies. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lohan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just wanted to say before I ask my questions uh, that urban planning is a phenomenal and a great uh, profession to study. Um, since I studied that myself, so I do appreciate the fact that you guys are doing that as well. Um, one question I did have uh, as you were doing the research, uh, did anything surprise you as you were uh, making your way uh, through, the, through the research? Uh, uh, I, I think at various points, yes. Oh, there's always going to be something that, <laughs> that surprises us. Um, one thing that... Uh, while we were going through our literature review was there was an almost, there's a relationship between, you know, density and the cost of servicing. And we found uh, studies that indicated that, yes, well, uh, cost to service per capita decreases as uh, population increases, there is kind of a, a, a plateau and then a breaking point um, where Anything over the study reference, I believe, five hundred thousand people. So a, a very large, very large city. Where um, above that, it actually started to increase to support that. But uh, looking at comp plans, I don't believe that Bloomington is aiming to hit five hundred thousand at least by twenty forty. <laughs> well, that would be quite a quite a feat <laughs> if we were to pull that off. Um, I, I am curious um, about I'm, I have just a personal interest I have around did you, did the literature review talk anything about condos and how in terms of how they may impact uh, uh, parts of those uh, equity uh, conclusions at all. So, I, mean, I can answer that. I did most of the literature review, and I don't think any of the sources we looked at looked at differences between rental and ownership housing at all in any context so yeah. thanks and then um you know you did mention something around uh, equity and uh and gentrification to be to, to to look out for that and i assume that that has to do with the policy but is there anything more that we should be as a policymakers be uh you know be be looking for as we get ready to look at some of this and maybe look to try to implement this that you'd recommend uh, uh, kind of referencing what um uh nick said the uh a lot of mixed-use developments, especially with the new retail space, uh, we found can be very prohibitive to um, smaller businesses. Just the the cost of renting brand new space is 
expensive. And uh, by keeping some older, maybe lower cost uh, business space within those mixed use districts will allow smaller businesses, businesses that are just trying to get their legs to remain or come into a an area that is seeing a lot of growth and improvement. And that's kind of a good um, maybe like feeder system into the uh, more expensive newer spaces. So um, I believe uh, Nick said they were looking at a the, the city is looking at that kind of business retention uh, ordinance. That's another great way to, to target those things. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. And Ms. Mr. Johnson. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. I'll invite the affordable housing team uh, up here. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for having us, um, and thank you for this, this opportunity, um, Acting Mayor Carter, um, Council Members, distinguished guests, and uh, I will, um, thought I, I would introduce ourselves. My name is Joe Amrine. Jamila Budlali. Michael Honer. Alex Griffin. So the um, goal of this project was to gather facts and data to show the impacts of city investments in affordable housing, their return on investment, and provide recommendations for a continuing evaluation and impact assessment of affordable housing investments. So a little bit about the background. Uh, during the mid-1970s, the federal government assumed exclusive responsibility for the production and financing of low and moderate income housing. The federal government began to have a diminished role in the late 1970s, and this led to the privatization of public housing, and they moved to a more market-based system that included uh, housing vouchers, or more commonly referred to as Section 8 vouchers. But since the 1970s, dramatic shifts in class structure have taken place. Despite these shifts in class structure, there have been little to no investments in the cost of housing. But um, with our research, um, we looked into um, uh, 15 uh, uh, individuals we interviewed and uh, and differences matter uh, with those interviews. So we uh, chose uh, cases that had a distinctive sociological scope as well as a variation in cultural characteristics because um, Bloomington Meadow uh, has a, uh, a Spanish population, Somali, and uh, English speaking. Is that me? Mm -hmm. So uh, we looked at the methods were Bloomington Meadows, the District Apartments, and Lindell Flats. But we focused on Bloomington Meadow because the District and the Lindell Flats would not allow us to interview their tenants. So we used a mixed methods interview that included interviews and surveys. And we had 12 self-selected interviews at Bloomington Meadows, self-selected meaning the residents chose to be interviewed. And we also interviewed ex expert uh, interviews with different developers and uh, and our findings uh, were generalizable for the interviews that we had conducted. All right. Um, so the sites that we had selected um, here is Blooming, or the sites that we had interviewed on uh, our Blooming Meadows North and Blooming Meadows now, South, which is one large site, but there are some distinct differences between the sites. Um, Blooming Meadows North on the right on the left is a newer property, 172 units um, built in 2021 and has a larger range of bedroom sizes up to four um, bedroom sizes and interviews with property management um, indicated to us that there's a large Somali speaking population. Um, and one challenge that residents at this site um, experience is with their access to amenities such as um, the community community room and the computer room not being available for use to them and also confusion about um, using the pool um, that's located at Blooming Meadow South. And then Blooming Meadow South, um, much larger unit count, 306, 
and there's a large Spanish-speaking population there. Um, the challenges at this property are um, decades of deferred maintenance and also resident sentiment um, because the residents were not allowed to transfer to the units at Bluey Meadows North when it was being constructed. So, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our process. So um, we started out with question development um, and trying to think about what our questions would be for both our interviews and our surveys. And we used our literature review as well as our subject matter expert interviews in order to develop these questions. Um, and our literature review focused on the um, impacts of affordable housing on economics, health, um, transportation, and education. And um, then the latter part of the semester was spent on recruiting, actually conducting the resident interviews. Um, we did one focus group and then several one-on-one -on -one individual interviews, um, and then also coming up with our findings, recommendations, and reporting, which we'll be talking about next. Now onto our findings. Residents emphasized four main topics in our interviews with them. The first was their access to walkability areas and transportation. Residents appreciated their proximity to the highway for a quicker commute to their jobs, living in a neighborhood where they could walk to their amenities, and specifically being next to the Mall of America where they could go shopping, work, or walk around. Second, some residents appreciated that they could talk to their neighbors and that they were friendly. Residents appreciated the diverse community and their Somali the Somali, Somali residents specifically appreciated representation in their community. Third, we learned from many residents that external factors still affected quality of life like responsiveness of uh, property management, perceived quality of housing, what their previous housing situation was like, and their perceptions on affordability. Tying into this, tenants on subsidy and those coming from homelessness or poor living situations emphasize greater benefits. This indicates that affordable housing especially benefits, benefits those most in need. Uh, for several members, the program allowed them to the opportunity to meet a diverse group of Bloomington residents and gain better cultural understanding of their neighbors while improving their worldview. We thought it'd be good to pull a few quotes from our interviews. Uh, in reference of walkability, uh, a tenant said that they love the mall, we've got a walking program, we go around and walk every day, and the, the amenities are great here. Uh, another tenant said, in reference to community, it's really nice, multiple communities, different cultures, different religions, we all get along well. And lastly, in reference to stability, a tenant referenced that definitely, it was definitely a big improvement. I just feel grateful that I don't have to not know where I'm going to be tomorrow. Uh, limitations include that the fact that we were only able to survey and interview at two properties in one location, which means our findings are not extrapolatable to other properties. The fact that the research is time intensive and we only had a couple of months to interview tenants constrained how many people we could interview. Affordable housing tenants are not typically the targets of public engagement, so trust and work needs to be built over time to get engagement numbers up. This is incredibly hard and, hard and resource intensive work. This transitions into the third limitation. The number of participants we had, 12 interviews and eight surveys, was not enough for any scientific findings, but it does help set a framework and narrative. Lastly, language barriers prevented us from interviewing some tenants who do not speak English as their first language, so interpretive resources would need to be made accessible in the future. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about our recommendations for how to expand upon this work. Uh, Firstly, we were encouraged by the work that's going on at the fire station and how that is being expanded to become a small business center. Um, we'd like to see more community-oriented spaces, uh, which transitions into uh, our second recommendation, which is regarding uh, events in the spaces. Um, the co-ed and um, Bloomington Police Department uh, are both involved in outreach work. Um, and we'd like to see kind of uh, Bloomington have more uh, kind of eyes on the ground um, with the Blooming Meadows site specifically. Uh, when we were conducting interviews on site, one thing that we heard time and time again from uh, residents was that they were just very uh, encouraged that we were on site listening, hearing their feedback, and it was just um, really good to have us there. So. Um, a big recommendation that we have is for the city of Bloomington to consider 
hiring a, a city liaison of sorts um, that would be able to uh, work with Coed and uh, BHAT as well as uh, Homeline in doing some of this um, coordination work on the ground um, and possibly expanding the number of programming events that are going on on site. Um, another thing that we heard from residents was that um, they uh, really appreciated um, uh, walkability um, and the ability to um, just access a lot of different amenities. So we recommend that um, Bloomington considers you know, future sites around access. Um, and specifically, we heard from Blooming Meadows that they had made a lot of improvements with um, making people feel safer at night while on foot. And so some of those things might be able to be turnkey type improvements that come um, at future sites. Um, regarding uh, the, the housing liaison, um, two other uh, roles that the liaison could perform would be uh, helping residents work through the application process and um, helping to advertise the opportunities that exist because that, that was other some other feedback that we heard from residents is that the application process was a little bit difficult to navigate, especially for those with language barriers. Um, then another recommendation we have, um, we uh, again did not have the ability to be as thorough as we wanted, but for future research, we recommend using a social return on investment methodology framework. And this would allow uh, fiscal proxies to be formed that would give a more concrete dollar for dollar in terms of you know, what are investments getting the city of Bloomington in social returns. Um, and we have that uh, much more uh, thoroughly outlined in our um, paper uh, report. And then lastly, um, we would love to see this work be expanded to include the district and Lindale Flats. Um, just to get a more comprehensive idea of how Blooming Meadows uh, compares and contrasts with those other sites at uh, Bloomington. So great. Um, let us know if you have any questions. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I will say, I know you mentioned the limitations and just the number of sites that agreed to be involved. I will say it is helpful to have kind of more of those qualitative pieces because I feel like often up Oftentimes we talk more about numbers of units and it's a lot of these quantitative numbers around affordable housing. And so it is helpful to have some of those qualitative pieces in terms of what residents are saying and feeling. Uh, so with that, do, you have, do we have any questions on council here? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Hello, nice to meet you all. Thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited to kind of look at the SO, uh, SROI methodology that you have. I have, um, I've, We've often talked about, um, and we kind of tried to pilot this a little bit, the, the notion of being able to define, um, for example, the economic benefit of, of um, environmental policy, right? So uh, whether that's carbon offset and the equivalent dollars and other things like that. Um, was there anything about the, first off, had you all, had you all heard of SROI before? Had that been something that you studied? And if so, was there anything that you can give us as just a little bit of a teaser about like what you learned about that as it relates to potentially these projects? I'd be certainly curious. Yeah, I can um, go a little bit more into, into that since uh, I was working a lot on the SROI piece. Um, I did not know very much about the methodology. I had done cost-benefit analysis at Humphrey, but not this specifically. Um, I do believe that it would be a really useful tool. And it would basically involve expanding the project to be much more survey-based. So you get a sense of what are the expected outcomes based on literature. So if, for example, you expect uh, affordable housing to increase housing stability, you find out how many residents out of the total pool experienced an increase in housing stability Ability. Then you can take a fix, fiscal proxy that might look like uh, a reduced number of moves per year, for example. So if someone who's housing unstable moves uh, an average of once per year, um, that can get translated to a dollar amount by saying, OK, what would be the average cost of a move? And then uh, by calculating that over the entire uh, number of observances per, per you know, site, 
you would get a, a broader sense of um, how much the affordable housing investment is saving in uh, saved moves. And so um, you would take, you know, that's just an example of one component, but then it would, a thorough investment investigation would involve, involve like 15 or 20 of those kinds of metrics um, spread out across, you know, different categories of research. Um, and we would, uh, you would want to have questions that would pertain to each metric that you're trying to hit for those. Great, thank you, I appreciate the education. Thanks. Council Member Lohman. All I wanted to just say is thank you. Uh, sometimes these studies don't turn out the way you, you had hoped. Um, just appreciate all the time that you spent uh, doing this. I'm sure we're gonna get um, a lot out of this and uh, hopefully uh, not only your group or this other group that's over here, maybe one day we'll see you guys uh, coming in here and working for uh, the great city of Bloomington, as you've mentioned earlier, Mayor. Thank you. I, I just wanted to um, echo that as well. Being a science major myself, I know how dry lit review is, so I appreciate the work <laughs> that you did for that. Um, so I'll be looking forward to reading the full report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ruler. Uh, yes, you may. Yes, you may. From your, what is it? From your lips to somebody's ears. Uh, I want you to introduce yourself and tell them what your next position will be with the city of Bloomington. <gasps> <laughs> so um, a few months or so back in September, I had the pleasure of meeting Carla over here at the American Planning Association Conference. And she told me, hey, you should come to Bloomington. <laughs> and thereby, there was a position posted. And I will be um, starting on Monday as a sustainability specialist over at Public Works, um, working with MS Dress. So thank you. Well, welcome to the city of Bloomington. We are obviously very excited to hear that. And thank you, Carla, as always. Um, that is really great. That's awesome. Um, any other questions? I also don't think literature reviews are dry. I'm just saying. No. <laughs> wow. All right. Great. Um, Mr. Johnson, is there anything else that you want to say to wrap us up? Well, thank you, uh, Acting Mayor Carter. As I said before, we'll make sure to distribute uh, these two reports uh, widely uh, and make sure to take every advantage of the recommendations uh, that we think are actionable and would benefit the city of Bloomington. So thank you for the time. Great. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, Member yeah, sorry, uh, Count, I appreciate you sticking around, uh, Mr. Johnson. Do you find that, did you find, as a city person, did you find the program beneficial? I think this was our first time using this uh, uh, coordinated effort between the U and, and uh, the city, right? Um, would you recommend we do it again? Yeah, acting uh, Mayor Carter, sorry, that's got a mouthful. Um, Councilmember D'Alessandro, absolutely. I would recommend it again. I think uh, you certainly want to have a good, solid, sound plan uh, heading into it. Um, but I always think there's a benefit of fresh eyes, uh, you know, kind of taking a look at the community. They might not know all the sites by all the names and the acronyms <laughs> and the terminology that we use here. Uh, but they come with them. Uh, you know, many of the staff here were in school uh, years ago, myself included. Uh, so there's certainly always new things to learn uh, and benefit from getting those fresh eyes. So I certainly would recommend it. Yeah. I look forward to the formal report, too. Great. All right. So we're going to move on to the next. Oh. Staff is really good to work with, too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next section of our agenda, which is our consent business, and Councilmember Mua has consent. Um, before I turn it over to him, there is one thing that we need to uh, go through. So we have a revised motion for item 3.7. Um, so I'm just going to read that motion. It would be to authorize the mayor and city manager to execute service agreements and any amendments thereto with PlayCore of Wisconsin doing business as Game Time and Minnesota Wisconsin Playground for Smith Park Playground Equipment and Installation in the not to exceed amount of $642,233. Uh, there was just a typo in the motion previously, and so we are revising that. Uh, so, Council Member Mua. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. <clears throat> so, tonight we I have two holds. Uh, hold for 3.2 and 3.11. So I would move to approve the consent agenda 3.1 and then 3.3 through 3.10 as they are written. Second. 
So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries for zero. Uh, so let's go with 3.2. Sure. Thank, thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, I this is um, I just wanted to hold this because I, I, it mentioned in the documentation that there were ten um, measurements, uh, and I was just curious what those were, because I, I was looking for the literature on it and the early the stuff I found was like from 2014, so I didn't know if that was accurate. Um, the measures in that in the assignment. Right. Yeah, I'd love to know um, what the actual local performance measurement bullet points are if that's possible not so much what we um what ours are so much as like just what the categories are All right acting mayor and council members council member d'alessandro off the top of my head i don't have those 10 um so we will follow up and uh Lori is coming to the uh, microphone she may have more information i don't know if she has all 10 areas um, we'll follow up and make sure we provide that information, but it is a, a structured program that we submit the information for every year, and by participating in the state program as a means of demonstrating how we track this information, they provide us some financial incentive as well. Lori, do you know all 10? Um, Acting Mayor Carter, um, Council Member D'Alessandro, and City Manager, I do not know all 10. We will provide the information um, in the one weekly. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councilmember Lohman. No, since we did hold that, I, I just um, I thought it was interesting when I looked at that that there was uh, some implications if there ever were a levy limit on that. I didn't recognize that. I didn't realize that that was something that was um, a part of these uh, measurements, and I wasn't sure if anybody wanted to talk about that or or. Uh... Miss Economy Scholar. Um, Acting Mayor Carter, um, over we initiated this program back in 2011. And since then, um, there was one or two years where there were levy limits. And depending on where the wording is in that levy limit, um, we can exclude different pieces of either capital. Um, normally, debt is outside of levy limits, but there might be other pieces that can be excluded. It all depends on the wording at the state in that levy limit year. I'll leave it right there because yeah. this could get complicated well, yeah. real quick. <laughs> If I can, uh, Acting Mayor Carter and uh, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, um, you're right, because it does get a little more complicated. And just so <laughs> folks are trying to track at home, uh, from time to time, the legislature has imposed levy limits on uh, local units of government. Uh, and actually, for a period of about 30 years, they had done that uh, more often than not. Now, they haven't since 2000 and. 11, 2010, somewhere in that neighborhood? Uh, I, I think there was one like in 14, 15. Right. It was like one year, right. and it was a very strange right. request. And, and, and sometimes the legislators will have language uh, that um, tries to incentivize behavior, as le legislators often do, right? And so one of the uh, additions uh, was that they would have performance management reporting be a way that local units of government could be exempted from certain levy limits. But we haven't had a levy limits discussion, and just in case anybody's wondering, for this uh, legislative session, uh, to my knowledge, levy limits have not been discussed at all. So. All right, any additional questions on item 3.2? If not, I would look for a motion. I'd be happy to move that. Uh, I move to adopt the resolution resolution authorizing reporting requirements for the local performance measurement program. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion cast carries 4-0. And we will move on to item 311, which is the memorandums of understanding with IAFF, VPOF, and AFSCME. So I'm assuming that I am turning. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I actually held that all, all, all in, in the sense that uh, uh, really just for two reasons. One, you know, I had seen, a, um, I think, one email from one person that was confused about uh, that uh, uh, the, the paid parental leave, um, uh, uh, there was some confusion about whether or not that applied to everyone depending on their status, um, and I just wanted to uh, just make sure that I understood that, that the, the idea was that this was going to be broadly applied across um, all, it, did not, yeah, it would apply to every single uh, employee that's a part of the uh, city of Wilmington. And I think that that's, this helps to clarify that. And you know, if there's anything you want to add to that, I just wanted to just be sure that I was clear about that and that, that it, we don't have you know, two different standards uh, for our employees. 
Uh, Acting Mayor Carter, Council Members, Council Member Loman, I'm going to have Mike Sable, our Assistant City Manager, just address it real quickly. Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Loman. You are correct. Uh, it was our intent for every employee to get the benefit. There was just a, a sequencing of paperwork and signatures that needed to make it, but every member also has been backdated to the uh, a date that the Council approved it. Oh, excellent. That's really all the questions I had, just to get that clarified. I'd be happy if, uh, if there are any other questions to make the motion, Mayor. Are there any other questions? Okay. Council Member Lohman. Mayor, I'd move to authorize the city manager and other required officials to execute memorandums of understanding associated with the 2023-2023 Ask Me contract, 2021 and 2023 IAFF contract, and the 2022-2023 uh, BPOF contract to include provisions related to paid parental leave and the language premium pay as accessible and so as to be consistent with the city's employment rules. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries 4 0. <coughs> so, with that, uh, we will be moving on to our organizational business because we do not have hearings, resolutions, and ordinances tonight. And the first item <coughs> is uh, 5.1 our neighborhood traffic management program update. Right. Hello, Ms. Long. Good evening, uh, Mayor. Acting Mayor and Council, it's my pleasure to present Ray Hayhurst with Kim Lee Horn and Associates to give us an update on the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program. Um, we're kind of at the point where we're concluding phase one and getting ready to move to phase two, and we want to make sure we got your input and gave you an update of where we are. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so our agenda for tonight, uh, we want to provide an overview of the project, uh, its purpose, its goals, and the schedule, as well as present uh, our initial proposal for speed limits on local streets, as well as any proposed changes to the traffic calming request program. Uh, we wanna share what we've heard from the community thus far, uh, as well as identify kind of next steps, next phases in the project. So again, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program is for local streets. Uh, the program will serve as a guide for addressing safety and traffic challenges uh, and improving safe neighborhood mobility. Uh, it's important to note that the program is one part of the city's uh, larger transportation strategy. Next slide. The program is intended to build on uh, the city's existing programs uh, and integrate uh, new programs and, and new elements. So tonight, we'll focus on the speed limits, on local streets, and the traffic calming request program. And really, the purpose is to create a comprehensive approach to manage tra traffic speeds, improve safety, and increase access for people, especially those uh, walking, biking, and taking transit. So we've identified six overall, overall program goals uh, that are consistent with uh, the city's ex existing transportation vision. Um, the goals include traditional transportation goals, um, you know, such as improving safety, enhancing mobility, and uh, removing barriers to accessibility. Um, the last goal uh, on this slide, uh, one goal with this program and one thing that kind of became very apparent uh, through our commu community engagement was the idea of creating a program that is more accessible, is clear and easy to understand, and really you know, more of the community is aware and can kind of take, take advantage of its benefits. So as Julie mentioned, uh, we're at the end of the first phase of the project. Uh, thus far, we have reviewed uh, existing programs, identified best practices, and collected data. Uh, we've introduced the project to the community and discussed our initial proposals. Based on what we've heard from the community uh, thus far and what we hear from the council tonight, uh, we'll develop a set of recommendations uh, to again, be discussed with the community in the second phase of the project. 
So what are local streets? Uh, local streets are uh, owned by the city as shown in orange on the map and they account for the majority of the city's uh, city owned roadways uh, city uh, Local streets are typically quieter uh, with less traffic and gen generally no more than one traffic lane in each direction. Most of the streets are very residential in neighborhood, but there are schools, places of worship, community centers, and other key destinations uh, that can be accessed by these streets. Currently, uh, the speed limit is 30 miles per hour on all local streets, uh, with no exceptions for school zones or areas with higher pedestrian activity. So the purpose of speed limits are to set expectations for drivers and other roadway users. When properly set, speed limits provide a safe, consistent, and reasonable speed. And really, the goal is to achieve voluntary compliance among the majority of drivers. But speed limits alone uh, do not determine driver speeds. Um, importantly, the roadway design as well as traffic conditions uh, greatly influence uh, driver speed and behavior. In 2019, uh, the state legislature permitted cities uh, in the state to set speed limits on their local streets with the conditions shown here on, the slide, on this slide. With this change in the law, uh, Several cities uh, in the metro area and statewide have lowered uh, speed limits on local streets. This includes Adina and St. Louis Park. So Adina, they set a 20 mile per hour on speed limit on lower traffic streets, and 25 miles per hour on slightly busier local streets, and then 30 miles per hour on higher traffic speed streets. St. Louis. I interrupt that sure. with St. Louis Park. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Disregard what I said. I <laughs> um, should also mention that uh, City of Richfield was also in the process last fall. Um, the staff recommendation was for a default speed limit of 25 miles per hour on local streets, but due to some staff turnover, they've pumped the brakes on that. They're considering mm -hmm. it just like you are considering it at right. this time. No one has adopted anything yet. Um, should note that uh, research measuring the impact of speed limit changes uh, in cities across the state thus far uh, is in progress. But nationally, uh, the research indicates a slight reduction in, in speeding, uh, especially high-end speeding, uh, and uh, reduction in crashes and crash severity. Next one. But that slight reduction in speeds can have a significant safety impact. Um, the risk to pedestrians significantly increases as driver speed increases. So that's not only the frequency of crashes, but also crash severity. So based on our review of uh, existing conditions and a review of what uh, other communities in the metro area are doing, are doing as well as best practices. Uh, we've identified three specific goals for setting speed limits. Uh, that includes uh, promoting safer speeds, so prioritizing lower speed limits near schools and other areas with higher pedestrian activity. The second goal is maintaining uh, a level of consistency, as we know that's important for voluntary driver compliance uh, with speed limits. And lastly, we wanna set reasonable expectations for drivers. Based on our data, um, most drivers are currently traveling 25 miles per hour or less on most local streets. Um, so again, we wanna set a reasonable speed limit that will lead to voluntary driver compliance, but also set safe expectations. So our current proposal is to lower the 
speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour on local streets citywide. And that's with a consideration for lower speed limits in school zones. In this consideration, uh, would entail a posted 20 mile per hour speed limit um, on larger streets around public and private charter schools uh, during arrival and dismissal periods. Our proposal is to evaluate st streets on a case-by-case -case basis uh, in partnership with the schools. And we recognize that a lot of, or several schools are adjacent to county-owned roadways, so we wanna have a partnership with the county uh, before we'd recommend any changes to the speed limits on, on their roadways. Uh, and with this consideration, uh, it would also include uh, updating the city's existing Safe Routes to School district-wide plan for K through eight public schools. So identifying strategies that would support uh, lower speed limits in school zones. So we provided an update to the Planning Commission on April 27th. Uh, based on what we heard, they were strongly in support of the school zone speed limits. Um, they did. They did have questions, or you know, they did were interested in, in learning more about the experience of peer communities and and their experience with the lower uh, speed limits on local streets. Uh, there were also questions regarding. Uh, the specifics of implementation and the costs. You know, what would it cost to lower speed limits citywide or around uh, schools? So the second focus area of the program is the traffic calming request program. The city has the existing multi-step traffic calming request process. To date, this has only amounted to one traffic calming device built. Uh, and the issues that we've identified with this existing process include, um, so step one, kind of th the barrier of having such a high level of support from only adjacent property owners, as well as a application fee. Um, Another issue that we've identified uh, is the special uh, tax assessment to fund any traffic calming device. So in addition, uh, as became clear during public engagement, awareness of the program is also limited. And on this slide, uh, just wanted to mention this. So the city currently has several traffic calming options in its toolbox. Uh, however, uh, despite the number of options, uh, implementation has, has been limited through this program. So based on our review of the existing program, as well as best practices, um, we've identified the following goals for building on uh, the existing program. I won't go through all the goals, but I just want to highlight uh, we have a goal of simplifying the process, updating the screening criteria that better reflects city priorities and is clear and transparent to the public uh, and can is transparent to staff as well. Um, other goals I'll highlight include you know pr providing trial options for traffic calming, so being able to test certain traffic calming treatments uh, and getting feedback from the community that way uh, before considering funding larger scale improvements. And lastly, uh, a goal we identified was a, a alternative funding source uh, as opposed to the current special tax assessment. So, Our uh, proposed process uh, is shown here on the screen. Uh, the key difference is uh, we're proposing an annual cyclical process for receiving and screening requests. 
uh, rather than staff evaluating and pr prioritizing requests received on an individual basis. And this will allow city staff to prioritize requests based on where the need is, is greatest. Next up. This proposed traffic calming process uh, would be designed to align with the city's uh, existing pavement management program process shown here on the screen and providing inputs at, at key steps along the way. We're proposing that local streets would uh, only be eligible for the traffic calming request program. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. We've identified uh, screening criteria uh, that would allow city staff, again, to prioritize uh, requests where needs are greatest. So this is criteria related to equity, community destinations, number of people, safety and experience, and traffic. Um, in the next step, next phase of the project, we'll identify specific metrics and potential weighting of the criteria. And again, to stress, the, this screening criteria is meant to be transparent and clearly communicated to the public. So when city staff advances a request forward, the public, uh, the council knows why a uh, certain decision uh, was made. We've also identified two tiers of traffic calming options. Uh, and this is meant to simplify the existing toolbox of options. So this first tier includes both trial and permanent options. So that includes curb extension, neighborhood traffic cir circle, and vertical uh, traffic calming devices. So that's a speed table, speed cushion, and speed hump. The tier two options are, are for the pavement management program. These options often require more complex engineering and construction and often with a greater need to study impacts on the adjacent street network. For each of these traffic calming options, we've identified key considerations uh, related to effectiveness, cost, ease of use, and other impacts. Uh, we, we're identifying uh, considerations for each of the options to make it, again, clear to the public and clear to staff and, and the council when certain options are appropriate to address certain issues based on a given, given context. And so in the next phase of the project, we'll flesh this out further. As I mentioned before, we've uh, presented our initial proposals to the community and asked for further feedback. Um, the, the response that we've received, uh, especially related to the importance of safety near schools, uh, is was pretty really stood out really stood out to us, and that was again echoed by the planning commission uh, last month. Other key themes that we've heard uh, were, again, related to the limited awareness of the existing traffic calming program, uh, as well as specific safety concerns in neighborhoods, as well as on non-local streets, so kind of outside their purview of the neighborhood traffic management program. Thus far, in the first phase of engagement, uh, we've mostly heard from adults over the age of 35, most, mostly people who are white, and slightly more women than men. I think it's important to understand who we've heard from, but also who we have not heard from, and that will help us uh, tailor our public engagement in, in the next phase of this project and make sure that we're hearing a greater, more voices from the community. As I mentioned, uh, we'll incorporate feedback that we've heard thus far uh, into recommendations that we'll 
we'll discuss with the community in the second phase. Uh, we'll update our survey and interactive map hosted on Let's Talk Bloomington. Uh, we'll host a virtual open house and conduct pop-up events to, again, make sure that we're hearing more voices. So again, uh, we're about to enter the, the second phase of, of the project. So the recommendations that we will identify will also include a set of uh, strategies. So that's policies, code changes, uh, and processes, as well as education and enforcement strategies uh, to support those recommendations. Um, and the goal is to present refined recommendations to the Planning Commission and the Council uh, this summer. And with that, uh, thank you for your time and certainly uh, welcome your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Hayers. This is uh, really exciting information. I know we've been talking about these issues since I started on Council, and I'm sure that this has been a conversation for many years before that. And so to kind of finally have the capacity to move this project forward and to kind of dig into these issues is um, really important. Uh, you know, we hear from residents all the time about their concerns about speed on streets in Bloomington. So um, I have a couple of clarifying questions. Sure. So when you talked about the um, research that's in progress in Minnesota, do you know when that research is expected to be done or available to other cities to look at? Um, Acting Mayor Carter, the Local Road Research Board, which is funded by a portion of the gas tax, has a current study on some implementation primarily in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and they expect to issue their report sometime in June. June, okay. That's um, good timing for us then. Um, and then my second question, you were talking about the cyclical process for the Tier 1 kind of neighborhood-driven um, requests. And so do you imagine that would be like a request for proposals that goes out almost like, not really, but similar to that type of process, like once or twice a year where resident groups would apply all at once and then they'd be vetted against criteria and a certain number would move forward? Acting Mayor Carter, you have everything correct with the exception of probably a request for proposal. Yeah. May not be the term we use. <laughs> yes, I probably would not use that. Um, well, I do like that because I feel like then we can have even more promotion and get people excited about it. Um, and of course, would want to give them enough lead time to organize their neighborhood and figure all of that out. Um, and then when you talked a little bit about the criteria, one thing I don't think I saw was accident data. So if there is a neighborhood that, and I don't know if this is publicly available or if they could ask the city for data related to accidents. Um, I know you had traffic, like I, I can't remember exactly what you had. Um, you had traffic, so volume, um, but I didn't know if you were actually gonna be looking at like where there have been um, crashes or any other kind of um, indicators that would tell us that they might be problem areas. Sorry, I'm not really good with this mouse. <laughs> no worries. I don't know how to scroll. We'll just, here we go. We'll go back to this one. Um, Acting Mayor Carter, um, here is a graph of the fatal, fatal and serious injury pedestrian crashes around town. So we are not seeing that kind of accidents on our local streets. Um, or general crashes. It's not a significant problem on our local streets. It's not to say it doesn't occur, but on most of those occasions, it, they may be weather related, they may be a drunk driver, they are not generally related to speed and other incidences like they are for some of our collectors and arterial roadways. So we did not feel accidents were uh, good judgment because we might have one accident on a street, but not a significant number, mm -hmm. but it's something we could look at if you felt strongly about it. Um, but that's, I mean, that's why we're here is to gather information, but Absolutely. to date the, the data we've looked at hasn't shown that that's a distinguishing characteristic that should be used in distinguishing applications from one another. And um, is it safe to assume then that it's not that this isn't important data and that 
you all are looking at it and thinking through like how can obviously we've you know we've had a lot of conversations around some of these intersections right where there's a lot of accidents so there are other strategies in place to help address the accidents um, that were these kind of these hot spots that we're seeing so it's still happening it's just not part of this effort Correct. Yep. Um, if you recall, our project at Old Shakopee and Xerxes, which I promise is going to be done soon, um, has a higher uh, crash rate than some of the other intersections along Old Shakopee Road. Um, so we are looking at those and we are looking for um, projects to help facilitate the decrease in the crashes because basically we don't, wouldn't like to see any hot spots in town. I think mm -hmm. everyone would agree that's kind of our goal. Absolutely. Um, but you'll also notice that they're not really showing up on local streets. They're on like major crossroads. So, um, well, I can give you my opinion on a couple of things quickly, and then turn it over to the rest of the council. I am open to looking at the speed limit reduction on all local streets from 30 to 25. There is part of me that kind of wonders if most people even know what the speed limit is on local streets or what local streets are, and so. Um, would be really curious to see the data in June from other cities who have done the same thing. Um, I also like, I can't remember which city it was that did, you know, kind of on busier streets, they maybe did 20 or 30 and then on less busy streets, it was 25, kind of more of a tiered approach, but um, absolutely open to reducing speeds in school zones. Um, that's something that, you know, when I moved to Bloomington years ago, I was kind of surprised that you know, we don't have those specific school zone um, speed limit reductions, and so absolutely um, interested in that. Um, and then I really like the changes that you're proposing to the traffic calming request process. Um, and I think that having really clear criteria, really promoting it widely across the city, getting people excited about the opportunity, um, and then being really clear, yeah, again, about what our criteria is is going to be super helpful. And I really appreciate all the engagement that you're doing across the city with the pop-up events and making sure that we're hearing from all residents. So with that, uh, Council Member Lohman. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I know you've been a, uh, a champion of this particular issue, and we appreciate that. Um, I know, you know those other council members who aren't here to, to say that on behalf of, but I wanted to just let you know how much I appreciate. Uh, uh, certainly this has been, uh, you know, 102nd Street and 106th Street have been, um, uh, throughout my time on council have been uh, major issues. And so I do welcome, um, as you do, uh, this idea of looking at um, uh, the calming piece. I was kind of shocked that only one uh, 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 request uh, had, had even gone through that old process. That's kind of, um, if I understood that uh, correctly. Um, so as we you know, kind of look at this, and I and also want to thank you for clarifying the Golden Valley piece, because I go to Golden Valley all the time. I have family that live there, and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm, I'm speeding and breaking the law <laughs> on those, uh, uh, on those uh, um, uh, city streets there. So one question that I did have, you know, as I looked at the, you kind of had a map where it had, you know, kind of taking the speeds down, you know, 30, 25, and 20, I think it was. You know, in terms of you know the risk to pedestrians, and we know that you know 106th Street and 102nd uh, Street are both school routes. Um, uh, you know, at various sections of that, and the question that I had in my mind is that um, you know it, it's you know I think about 106th Street. I take that all the time. You know, if you're you know fluctuating that that speed from 20 to whatever that that upper limit might be, let's say it's 30. And we know that people typically drive. I mean, I've sometimes, you know, had people passing me, you know, in that middle lane that we we put, because um, I'm I'm just going, you know, the whatever the 30 is on that, you know, to keep you know keep pace with that. I've got people passing me on that, you know, going 40 because they're upset with me. Does it make sense to, you know, just keep that at 20? You know, what happens when you know we keep that at 20? all of the time so that there isn't this confusion, you know, when the lights are on, the lights are off, that kind of thing. It, have we seen anything with that? If you, if, you know, in terms of that, cause I, I guess I have a you know, bit of a preference and I imagine 20 is the lowest we can go. I mean, we can't go down to 15. I'm just kind of curious. I don't know that I'd want to even propose that, but I just, that's, that's one question that I did have. And then, um, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, you want me to give you all the questions now or do you want me to hold? Um, Acting Mayor Carter, Council Member Lohman, if you wouldn't mind giving us a chance to respond, okay, because otherwise we'll probably miss a question or two in there, and we would hate to do that because they're 
They're good questions. Um, we ha are concerned with leaving on 20 miles an hour um, all the time because we did a study of our local streets and 102nd and 106th are not considered local streets. So I just want to make sure that the public understands that. I know you understand that, but they're not currently proposed for this. We do have a phase two both for this project and then for speed limits where we're looking at doing something for our collectors, but we're, we're still gathering the data. We don't want to make um, decisions without having a good basis in our recommendation. Um, you can see that um, this graph with the box graphs that over on the right hand side or left hand side is the 30 min miles per hour. The mid one is 20. Maybe I'll go to the next graph. That's a little better. This one's 25. So you can see right now, most of the drivers on our local streets are considerably below 25, but we do have s several people who are above 25, including some crazy person who's going like 50. Um, and we mentioned, as Ray mentioned earlier, we want voluntary compliance. So if we set it at 25, we're pretty confident we're going to get really good voluntary compliance. Um, we don't want to put extra burden on our police staff and the enforcement. We're not sure. It, speed reduction requires enforcement, education. It includes engineering. Like if it's a wide 44 foot wide street like it is in Bloomington often or the 36 or the 32 and it doesn't have a whole lot of street parking that encourages you to drive faster because there aren't any obstacles in the way so what we have built since the 60s and a lot of our infrastructure in place doesn't promote going 20 miles an hour because there's no reason to. So a driver isn't going to change their behavior as they're driving down a 36 foot wide street with nobody parked on it. They're going to be like, well, this isn't appropriate. I'm going to go the speed that I think is appropriate, which unfortunately isn't going to be that 20 miles an hour. So now you as a law abiding citizen are going to be going 20 miles an hour. And I, as a, you know, scoff law of the law, am not going to be going 30, 35. Now we have speed differential and we have a higher risk for crashes. So we don't want that. We want people to be voluntary compliant. We want people to understand that, yeah, this is the right speed. Ray's going 25. I'm going 25. You might be going 27, but we're all fairly close to bunch together. We don't have those outliers. So we're looking to get the voluntary compliance. This next slide shows you if we set it at 20 miles an hour, I have a whole lot of people who are no longer voluntarily compliant. So I have to figure out how to educate them and get them to change their lifelong behaviors. And that's going to be a struggle for engineering. Uh, thank you, Ms. Long. I did want to clarify, did you mean specifically in school areas? That, because, because I think you had talked about reducing the speed to 20 during school hours or when school is starting and letting out. Yep. And I think, were you talking mostly about like the school zones and decreasing to just permanently 20 so it's not fluctuating? <laughs> yeah, it's not. Day. Yeah, no, I think you've got it right, Mayor. Uh, just that, that fluctuation uh, is the thing I'm concerned about. It's, it's, you know, I mean, certainly over the whole summer, you know, unless you have summer school, now there's summer school. Uh, you got that whole time to kind of be thinking, I'm going 30, 30, you know, or 25, as it were. And then all of a sudden, now it's 20, you know. So it's just, you're fighting that all the time. So I just wondered if there is, in the school zone, does it make some sense to just, just leave it at 20 uh, altogether? I don't think I would recommend that. But one of the things that Ray brought to our attention is in some school zones uh, around the country, and he, I don't want to quote where they're located because I'll get it wrong and someone else. Um, there are lights that are timed to when school is going into session and coming out of session. And I know that that's personally very helpful for me because I don't have children of school, like, and I don't know when school's in session or what time it starts. Or, and so, or if you're visiting a different community, I don't know their choices, so it will flash only when it's the appropriate time of day. Um, I don't know if there's any research that uh, about that effectiveness versus going off, but I think a flashing light is more effective than just a sign. And then I just had a couple other real quick questions um, that just build on, off of that. So. Yeah, and, and I thank you for taking the bait on the 106th and 102nd Street, you know, around the idea that those are not <laughs> local streets. So um, uh, 
in, in terms of you know making those roads, you know, using the traffic calming uh, pieces that we have, um, is there a ways in which that we can partner in order in order to get some of those uh, calming? Uh, uh, elements that we've got there to, to, to be able to partner to get some of those things there so we can get some of what you talked about earlier uh, to slow that traffic down on that 102nd and 106th Street if we, we partner with our you know our, our folks out there to do that that's that's my next question um, acting mayor Carter council member Lohman we do have an existing um, collector traffic calming program as as your question indicates it's probably as well known as our local street c traffic calming program so we there is that option out there. With regards to the specifics of some of the 102nd um, concerns that we've heard from the public, what we're recommending in engineering is to do a corridor study of that whole area and to make sure that we can get some of the school buy-in and some of the neighbor buy-in. Um, engineering staff um, in the traffic area has brought different proposals at different times. I think one was in don't quote me on any of the years, like 2008 and then 2014. And other councils have decided not to go forward with those. But, you know, it's been a decade since we've looked at that. So maybe now is the right time because we have heard a lot of feedback most recently in looking at those. But that is completely separate um, from this thing that we're discussing this evening because these are local streets for our neighborhoods and not related to our collectors or our arterial roadways I, I have to i have to bring this up and bring that up because i know that there'll be emails in my box tomorrow uh, after folks watching that and that's why i wanted to make sure i brought that up and you you hammered that that forward so now with that being said my final question is around uh um you know how much this stuff costs you know in terms of it's you know it's great to kind of you know take the the cost you know away to allow folks to kind of take advantage of it you know but then on the other hand um you know taxpayers have to kind of pay for this and you know you may pay for it in many different ways too you know by injury or or some other way so it does make some you know perfect sense to to go on ahead and, and, and do some of these things so i'm not saying that there's there isn't a cost if you don't do these things but what i'm wondering about is from a, from the alternative standpoint how do we how do we fund this from a long-term standpoint and make that sustainable uh so that we can you know take it full advantage of these things so we know you know after you know, having i've studied transportation planning um and was a transportation planner for a little while, um, I understand the the, the import of uh, of these types of things and how they can really change how a neighborhood uh, operates and, and works. Um, Acting Mayor Carter, Council Member Loman, um, we haven't figured that part of the process out. Uh, we just wanted to see what kind of appetite there was from council. If we got away from the assessing of the adjacent parcels, if that was a thumbs up or a thumbs down or neutral. Um, but we have not figured out how how to do it yet. Well, a thumbs up for getting rid of the assessment, but then how do we pay for it? Yeah. So then, then you know, it might be a thumbs down if you tell me it's some other way we can't sustain that long term. Right. Any other questions or comments, Councilmember Mua? Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor. Um, I think what this is speaking to me is that there's an intersection problem, not necessarily a local streets speed limit problem because um, if, you, if you look at that map that you you showed where the heat map where all the accidents were occurring they're at all those intersections of those major county roads and the the question i guess then my question is how do we work with the county to affect those because it's not coming from our local neighborhood streets that is causing this issue it's the transitions from the local to the county roads that are higher, that are uh, more heavily trafficked, that are that we're seeing these issues. So I'm interested about that. Um, Acting Mayor Carter, <clears throat> Council Member Mua, that may not be entirely true. One of the unique things, if if you're a police officer and you're filling out an accident report, you look at where you are, you go, oh, yep, that's the intersection. So you write down the intersection. It may have occurred four houses in from the intersection. It may not be actually at the intersection, um, but that's what the data we have. So I wouldn't go as far to say that it's clearly an intersection problem. Yes, are there probably a higher number at intersections? Yes, because there's a lot more conflict points at an intersection when people are turning left and going through and that. But I wouldn't make that 100% true sure and i'm looking to mr roberts in case he wants to clarify because you know he's the real traffic engineer 
Mayor Carter, Council Member Mobile. Well, to your question, though, on the, the intersection crashes, speed is always an issue. Um, and they are always worse when speed is involved. And so if we can slow down the speeds on our larger roads, uh, the city-owned ones that intersect the county ones, we're going to be way ahead. We're going to reduce these dots. We're going to make those crashes a little less impactful, a little better. And so that's the next four, that's the proposal that I'm working on next is what are we going to set the speed limits on our local streets? So you'll be hearing back from me on that shortly. But um, speed is always an issue and we want to get that low on those larger roadways. That's going to take um, obviously changing the, the speed limits. It's going to require you know, police enforcement. And so Julie and I are going to head over and, and see the chief here pretty soon and we're going to start talking about enforcement programs and what we can do to support their work in that. Um, on the county front, the county was not granted the same authority by the legislature to change their speed limits on their roadways and there's nothing afoot yet that allows them to do that. There's some conversations about their ability to change speed limits for larger cities first and then uh, maybe other cities later. Uh, and so we continue to monitor, monitor those discussions. But right now, there's no, um, they don't have the ability to change their own speed limits and they don't have the intent to push that right now. So, Thank you. That, that's very interesting because I think that's a big piece of this as well is that county side of it. Um, okay. Um, the, the next thing I have, when we look at the people that you've spoken with, um, I would highly recommend that we, we talk with our, our youth. Uh, that 16 to 18 range, that new driver, uh, especially when it comes to the school district and, and those roads right by those schools. Uh, I would love to make sure we're engaging them so that they're early on in this uh, learning process as they've started driving uh, so that they can continue to be like those lifelong safe drivers. So I uh, highly encourage uh, getting that representation. Uh, thank you, Council Member Mua. I would like to point out that we did have a pop-up at Kennedy High School, so well, we tried. We may not have been as successful as we had hoped. Um, uh, thank you, Ms. Long. I mean, I think if you got 17 interactions with students, that's actually pretty, pretty good. Um, <laughs> um, Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Acting Mayor, especially since they might have just been grunts as they walked away from you. <laughs> Love our youth, absolutely. Um, so uh, give, just in a, the interest of time, um, I want to make sure I give you the right feedback here. Um, uh, I... I believe um, that the traffic calming program uh, streamlining process looks great to me, and I think um, that the uh, um, our ability to um, uh, waive certain fees or, or um, uh, provide some incentives for how we can do a, a, a you know a city partnership. I'm not I'm not sure if the maybe the 7525 rule that we have uh, for some of our other um, PMP type programs would be useful there, but maybe that's a way that we can look at that since that would be parity across what we have today. Um, I am a massive fan of uh, school zones. I was floored when I saw that we didn't have them. And even on roads where, um, where we can't necessarily change um, uh, like the total, ta ta you know, the total t um, um, speed limit. Um, I'm thinking 84th Street, for example, where you go and uh, there's all kinds of them. You've got Washburn and you've got Poplar Bridge and you've got the Northwest Sciences University and things like that. Um, even if we didn't change the, the speed limit in general there, you could certainly put school zones there and you would, you would do a lot of good. Um, and I even think the people that have us with those stop signs on 84th as it gets closer to Normandale would benefit from slower speed limits just by having the school zones there. So um, I'm here for it. Uh, I think it's great. And then um, uh, I think you asked about proposed speed limits. You know, for, for me, the, the biggest combination of problems is the wide streets and the fact that we have so many, um, what do you guys call them, uh, uninterrupted intersections? Or how do you say that? I can't remember what they're called. I apologize. Uncontrolled. Yeah, that, that's a good word for it. Um, I, for example, um, and, and I know uh, Mr. Roberts and I have talked about this a lot because I watch, I'm on Emerson Avenue, and if you look at 82nd Street to 86th Street, you go through two major, what I would say major, um, un, uh, uncontrolled intersections. Uh, it's a straight thoroughfare. It's wide, and um, I can see 45, 50 mile an hour just in those four blocks, right? They come off 82nd Street, which is a big street. 
They want to get through the neighborhood. Um, and there are kids coming down the street on bicycles to try to get to Bryant Park. And so I'm very interested, and I didn't see a lot of it in the program that you gave today, but I'm very interested in what you're specifically doing around parks. Um, and I and I appreciate so much that you took seriously the need to both like to look at parks, master plan and traffic together, because, um, you know, spending all of this investment in our parks and then not doing anything to make sure that kids can get there safely on bikes and then skateboards and things like that would just undermine everything we're trying to achieve. So um, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I need there's nothing here for me to react to specifically, but I'm excited that you're looking at it. Thank you. Um, Acting Mayor Carter, Councilmember D'Alessandro, you're right, it's not highlighted really well in our pr uh, presentation today, but I can tell you that we just gave Park and Rec feedback on both Bryant and Tretba of proposed sidewalks and crossings, so you will be seeing that coming forward. Um, engineering is proposing to have a, well, for back of a letter, let, lack of a better term, a sidewalk project that goes right in hand with our um, park projects. All right, are there any additional questions or comments? All right. Well, thank, thank you for you your time. Long, and thank, thank you, Mr. Ha Hayhurst. It's Hayhurst, right? Correct. Hayhurst. Okay, yep. so I'll make sure I was pronouncing it right. Thank you. Okay, so next up on the agenda is a public safety update. So Chief Hodges is joining us. Hello again, Chief Hodges. Good, how you doing? <laughs> All right, what screen am I looking at, Mike? All right. So I got control, right? I've been here for a year, so I can push my own buttons. All right, we're good. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> let's get started. Um, Maybe I can push my own buttons. Okay. All right. So just to be, I'm going to do this uh, public safety briefing here just to give you a overhead kind of what took place during 2022, uh, where we're at now, and a few uh, just overview of some things we've done with the department this year. So first, I just want to thank the uh, city council for giving us money to do the uh, center uh, for values-based initiatives, uh, and that allowed us to have community-based focus groups to where we could develop our mission statement and core values uh, in conjunction with the community and our staff. And as you see here, our mission is to always be respectful while keeping our community safe. And uh, respect is what we do. And we've implemented this throughout the police department, through our policy manual training program and our promotional and hiring process. And we're also in the process of updating our performance evaluations to also reflect these core values. Right now, um, our department is currently uh, fully staffed. Um, and as you can see here, we're not uh, heavy in administration and whatnot, but I do wanna take a second just to brief the council on a couple of things that are not on here. Um, we're currently in a hiring process for a police officer. And this last go around, we had less than 50 applications, which uh, for the destination city, in Minnesota is something that should concern everyone. And of the less than 50, we only had 31 people that met the minimum qualifications. Now, I say that to say uh, some of our other counterparts have had three and some of our neighboring cities have had zero. So here's my plea <laughs> to you all um, is we need help recruiting uh, police officers right now. And I say to the detractors, people who don't particularly like law enforcement too much, and sometimes people don't think that uh, police officers represent their values, now is a good time to help recruit some of those folks. Um, and also to our supporters, um, it's nice that you support us and whatnot, but we need a lot of people to apply for these jobs. Now, again, you look at our numbers here in Bloomington, uh, we are fully staffed and our 125 authorized complement, which your increase, um, even though we don't have those two bodies now, we intentionally held those positions open for our candidates, our cadets. So the way we do our hiring here, which has allowed us to stay over, or allowed us to stay fully staffed is we hire in chunks. So we hire cadets and traditional police officers all at once. So when the traditional police officers are through training, we have the cadets that are ready to fill those positions. So we're not in a position where 
we're chasing our tail trying to get people and falling behind uh, so that's that's where we're at right now with our staffing here on the license side our support services bureau special operations bureau core values bureau administration and investigations bureau are also uh, fully staffed with the exception of our dispatch center and we're only down one dispatcher right now which is um, a feat compared to where we were at the beginning of 2022. Uh, right now, again, our Pathways to Policing uh, program just uh, closed, and our, we're looking to uh, hire also a part-time radio technician, and our dispatchers are in the current testing process. So during 2022, um, what we've been able to implement uh, with your assistance is uh, we've started a BPD street crimes unit. Um, and the street crimes unit uh, job is really to focus on areas where we're having high crime and high victimization rates. Um, a lot of agencies in Hennepin County participate in VOTIF or the Violent Offender Task Force. Um, I've decided that we're going to have a specific Bloomington uh, based unit with those officers here to service the community of Bloomington. I just believe that that is better service for us here in the city of Bloomington to have those officers here working on our issues, especially considering the amount of hotels that we have here and really focusing on some of this human trafficking stuff. Uh, two training officers, this is key. Um, and I wanna thank the city manager for supporting this. Uh, we've able to uh, have two training officer positions uh, this time and training is something that's really uh, key to how we do our jobs and how we're able to do them effectively. Uh, dispatch quality assurance coordinator, uh, this is key also. <laughs> it allows us to have our dispatchers actually get training Right. And right now, before having this, when we hired somebody, we'd have to have our dispatchers train them in the dispatch center, uh, which could be problematic and also prevented us from hiring and training as many people as possible. So uh, Katrina has hit the ground running on that. Uh, I'll just briefly go through some of this other stuff. We've reestablished a second sergeant in the South Loop, and we've also fully staffed our crime prevention unit uh, here moving forward to 2023. And our authorized strength goes to 127 in June, and uh, we should be able to continue to be fully staffed just based on our applicants right now with our cadets and traditional pool. So I'm, I'm not worried this go around about staffing, but into the future, uh, we could be seeing some issues. Uh, some of the department initiatives that we've done, uh, this is uh, Sigma Tactical Wellness is really looking at our cardiac screening. Now, you may or may not know we hosted a big funeral today here in um, Bloomington at Cedar Valley. Unfortunately, a officer at a neighboring agency had passed away due to a cardiac issue, and this is something that is really big in our profession. And uh, the city, through its wellness um, fund, paid for half the price for the officers to get this, and the other half the officers paid for. This is a phenomenal opportunity here. Our, our checkup from the neck up, uh, mental health. Uh, for officers is something that's key. We changed providers this year. Uh, the department will pay for um, six visits for an officer in addition to the one visit should uh, he or she need that. We've also increased our peer support, which is obviously one of the biggest things in terms of officer wellness is being able to talk to someone who <laughs> you know and trust, so that's good. Uh, this summer, uh, we are going to have our investigators start looking at cold cases. Uh, being fully staffed allows us to start opening up and looking at uh, some of these things. So I know there's some families out there that we've been in contact with that are really concerned about their loved ones and just be assured that this summer we're gonna uh, be able to start looking at some of those cases. Um, 70th anniversary is coming up here this year. Uh, the police department's 70 years old, so open house is next uh, May 20th, so come on out uh, for that. All right, crime stats. I'm going to go over these, and I want to explain something to people watching. Uh, we use our Central Square crime stats, or which come from our Logis record system. This is different than what is reported to the BCA. These numbers are going to be higher. And why do I report that? Because some of the numbers that are reported to the BCA do not include all things that we do here. So for example, traffic citations, uh, ordinance violations, and things of those that nature are not reported in NIBRS. So this is why we're gonna give the citizens of Bloomington everything we track. So that is why. Now, the NIBRS numbers may be lower in some of these cases, but 
this is the numbers we got, and they're going to be uh, higher. Uh, overall, crime in the city of Bloomington is still at a four-year low, uh, regardless of how you look at it, regardless if it's the NIBRS uh, numbers or um, the Central Square numbers. So this stat here uh, goes over the crimes that we've seen a decrease in between 21 and 22. And I do want to point out um, a few decreases here that we had. Um, motor vehicle theft is an area that a lot of people are talking about. Uh, last year in the city of Bloomington, we had a decrease in motor vehicle theft. Uh, we went from 320 vehicles stolen in 2021 and uh, 292 stolen in 2020. Two. Now, I realize to a person, if you've had your vehicle stolen, the police chief up here <laughs> standing and telling you that uh, that ve less vehicles have been stolen is no condolence to you. But um, and I fully understand that. But right now, uh, that that's where we're at. Uh, we've seen a decrease in rapes, robberies, vandalism, and weapons offenses uh, throughout um, between 21 and 22. <laughs> Increases. Crimes that we've seen an increase in. Uh, DWI, that's why the uh, city attorney said that she's starting to get more work. <laughs> so uh, DWIs last year went up from 359 to 440, 452, which is almost an increase of 100 DWIs in a year, which is a lot. Um, so we also had a increase in murders. Uh, we had one murder in 2021, and we had two in 2022. And uh, we had an increase in negligent manslaughter. Uh, we had zero in 2021, and we had two in 2022. Negligent manslaughter was uh, the criminal vehicle uh, operation that took place at the uh, Walgreens. And uh, the other one was an overdose death that uh, was a result of a negligent homicides. Um, our property crime, or excuse me, priority crimes here again, just goes over. Uh, what we're looking at here. And, and I don't, the only thing that right now is trending where I do expect um, to see an increase is like I said, in 2022, we did have a decrease in motor vehicle theft, but right now uh, at 77 through the first three months of the year, we may have an increase if, if this trend continues for uh, 2023 in a motor vehicle theft. Pursuits. Uh, last year we had, uh, this is our record number for pursuits, 115 pursuits, um, 74 were terminated. If things continue to go the way they're going this year, uh, I expect to see uh, a decrease in the amount of pursuits that uh, we are engaging in. And I think, you know, people understand that in Bloomington, uh, we do pursue vehicles. I know some other agencies don't, but we do it in a safe, effective manner. So this is the other slide that people always call about. So this is our cause for service at the Mall of America. And uh, District 56 is the South Loop. So if you're, if you're looking at this. So in 2021, we had uh, 4,092 calls at the mall. In 2022, we had an increase of 4,903 calls at the Mall of America. And overall in South Loop, uh, we've also seen an increase in calls. And if you look, uh, calls for service January through March, uh, we've also seen an increase versus this time period last year uh, at the mall and in the South Loop. And if things keep going this way, we can expect to continue to see, um, well, we will see an increase from 2022 to 2023 if things continue on this trajectory uh, for the South Loop and the Mall of America. Biggest calls at the mall or the most common calls are shoplifters, as you can see here, medicals, uh, trespasses, and sometimes some traffic stops. And right now, um, we're looking at uh, 400 trespasses. So if this continues on this pace, uh, we should be probably identical to where we were in 2022 and 2023 for shoplifters at the mall. Juvenile arrests. Um, we had a significant amount of increase in juvenile arrests. In 2021, we had 231 juvenile arrests. In 2022, we had 339. And currently, um, we are at 88. And if this continues, uh, we're going to have an increase in juvenile arrests this year versus last year. Referrals for social workers. 
Um, as you can see here, uh, our crisis intervention team had a significant um, amount of call volume increase. We went from 421 to 586 in one year. Um, but the good part about seeing the crisis intervention team deployed is we didn't see a subsequent increase in the amount of people that were uh, submitted to the hospital for emergency evaluation. So we think we've been able to divert some of those folks just based on uh, those numbers. Overdoses. Um, last year. Chief Potts. Yeah. Oh. All right, sorry. <laughs> Chief Hodges. Oh my gosh, sorry. Um, can I interrupt you? Yes. Um, don't know where that came from. It's been a while. Um, if he's can I watching, ask you really yeah. quick? I have a couple of uh, questions. Yep. Some clarifying. Yep. Um, when you were talking about the calls for service in the District 56 and mm -hmm. MOA area, and then the next slide was MOA top four incidents, incidences. Um, I assume that the top four are specific to the mall property and yes. the district, right? Yes. Okay. And then um, do you have graphs, maybe they're not included in this presentation, but that you could send that would that really does just pull out the MOA property? Yes, I can that. get you that. So the um, this okay. so back to your question, I misspoke here. The uh, top four does include the entire um, South Loop, the overwhelming majority of these are going to be at the mall because okay. there's just not the retail other establishments that people are stealing from yep. over there. So I can we can get that to you, just specifically pull out MOA. I'm just curious, as the population density has increased in the South mm -hmm. Loop, um, it feels like, I mean, obviously with more people just living in an area, then we'll see crime, you know, increase in that area, I would assume. Um, and so I guess I'd just be curious. And then for juvenile arrests, what are those typically related to? Like, um, huh. Well, uh, we've had a lot of um, weapons charges with juveniles, uh, vehicle theft, shoplifting. Um, so some of your typical juvenile issues, unfortunately. The auto theft uh, for juveniles has been one that's been really concerning to us. So... I think we're facing the same issue with juveniles that everybody else around the metro are. And do what happens when we arrest a juvenile? Can you talk about that? Process? Yeah. So do you have anything that we do to try to like help them? And I know I remember you and I having a conversation months and months ago about this, but I guess I'm just curious. Yeah. So our social workers will follow up with uh, the family members if they're able to get in touch with them. Sometimes that can be a barrier to getting in touch with some of the families, but that's essentially what we try to do for folks. Okay. And then how many social workers do we have embedded in the police department right now? Is it two? Two. And then potentially a third one eventually? Uh, we're looking at a different option that I'm not really to discuss okay. right now. Okay, that's fine. But two, I just wanted to <laughs> yeah. double check. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting me interrupt, and I apologize. Oh, any of y'all can interrupt <laughs> anytime you want. You know, I'm just uh, rambling on here. All right. Uh <laughs> So um, where did I go back to? Overdoses. Um, we actually had one less overdose in 2022 versus 2021, but the biggest difference was fatalities. Uh, we set a record in Bloomington for fatalities for overdoses last year. So we had 19, and that's a record. And these do not include any overdoses that take place uh, at the transit station at the mall of America along the light rail because Metro transit deals with those uh, right now. So that's, these do not include that, but if things continue based on the uh, first um, four or three months, uh, we do expect to see an increase in overdoses um, and an increase in the non-fatal overdoses. Our fatal overdoses are trending to be lower than 19 right now. So hopefully, the fatality trend continues, but we have had three so far this year. All right, with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you, Chief Hodges. Uh, questions? Uh, Council Member Lohman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, uh, I know that uh, we keep hearing that, uh, you know, and I appreciate that you, may, you had mentioned that we're in a four-year low uh, from a crime perspective. 
uh, you know, no matter how you kind of crunch those numbers. But I have heard people say, well, no, that's not what I'm seeing in the press. That's not how I'm feeling. Um, you know, it, it's kind of this anecdotal, you know, you see this thing here, there. I wonder if you could could, could speak to that, um, um, you know, given that we're at a four-year low. Yeah, and again, I'm going to preface it with this. Uh, as police chief, me telling you crime is at a four-year low, if your house has been broken into, if you've been robbed, um, if your car's been stolen, means nothing, right? But the numbers do show that statistically that is where we're at. And it's not due to the fact that people are not calling the police because people do call us. Um, so this is where we're at. Um, I'm glad to see it. I'd like to see us at a hundred year low. So that's, <laughs> that's our goal is, you know, for me, I look at this as just less overall victimization of our citizens. And that's something that we're going to continue to try to do. So I can't control what happens in other <laughs> places but um here uh, i think the message is clear if you come here and break the law we're going to lock you up so so then i um <clears throat> uh i see that we have what are things that are called pri priority crimes i'm curious you know from that 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 definition what what makes a um a crime a priority because i you know there's and then i want to ask you about uh, another category so yeah, so if you look at priority crimes, they're listed there, and this is primarily formed off um, the Uniform Crime Reports or Group A type offenses. Uh, so your murders, negligent homicides, your rapes, your robberies, your aggravated assaults, your burglaries, and your motor vehicle thefts. Uh, those are typically going to be your uh, priority crimes. And that's defined by the Uniform Crime yep. uh, piece of it. So I, I was just curious because I saw, you know, from 2021 to 2022, that the human traffic uh, piece had had seen a significant uh, drop off. And I was curious, one, how did that happen? And then my other question is, well, wouldn't that? Well, why would that be a priority crime? You know, um, um, and, and it, given we don't um, we don't define that, I was just kind of kind of curious. I just want to make sure that I understand that. So my, my first question is. You know what? You know what? If anything, you could account for that that drop that we saw, um, which I think that's you know either good news or, you know maybe they, you know we're not catching it. Maybe they've got a new technique. And then, um, uh, and I think you've already answered the other piece about the uh, why that isn't a priority crime. So human trafficking, um, I'm going to say we didn't catch it, um, and this year we've taken a different approach, um, where we're going after. I'm not going to get into our complete strategy here, but. Um, I do expect to see an increase in numbers for this. Obviously, we have 10,000 hotel rooms here, 49 hotels. Um, I think we and other agencies, too, have, have missed um, some of these types of activities that take place in the community. Thanks for, uh, you know, being forthright about that. And then the final thing I wanted to ask is uh, – um, uh, some folks have, have come to me, you know, not, not very many, very small numbers, but just this concern that uh, that if we were to have the expo here, that somehow that that would drive crime across the uh, uh, across the city. Um, um, I don't know if there's any truth to that at all. I know that, that we'd bring a number of, you know, if we were, were to get this uh, a piece, it would bring more people here. So just by raw numbers, that may increase certain types of things that happen, you know, in that area. But uh, um, I'm just curious if you had any uh, commentary uh, around uh, the expo and, and, and bringing extra folks here that that would bring, you know, crime across the entire city. Um, I do not have any data to make that determination. Um, and here's why I'm my, and we've really, my staff and me, we've really looked at this. There hasn't been an expo in the United States of America for decades, right? So I get really reluctant when I compare United States to other countries. Um, we're just different. And so I, I don't have any data to back that up. So uh, we're, we're going to, you're going to be assured we're going to have a plan in place to make sure that we uh, protect people. And I know that working with uh, community development, there's going to be some design issues that take place to make sure that, um, you know, we have a safe environment also, but I, I just don't have any data to back that. You know, I appreciate that. There, there's a data to go either one way or the other on that because there just isn't history there. Thank you for that. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Acting Mayor. Thank you, Chief Hodges, for all you do. Um, a quick comment on that. I, I think um, uh, the State Fair and its annual 
you know, moving 500,000 people, uh, as well as the recent Super Bowl in 2018 and stuff like that. I'm hoping that there's regional data that might be supportive for you in those regards. Uh, at least I've been saying that that's probably what we're going to be looking at. So I hope that that's true. Uh, <laughs> but I would, I would, I would also suggest, um, and you can tell me if this is not true, but given the high profile nature of that, we will be seeing national guard. We will be seeing, uh, Secret Service will be seeing all kinds of things brought to bear on on supporting that, given like the Olympics might, for example. Would would you agree with that, or is that an overstatement on my part? No, obviously we'd uh, have some partner agencies uh, to assist uh, federal, uh, but we'll work with the city manager to make sure we have a plan in place for Bloomington. And I just want this council to understand something very clearly here. Historically, when we've done things like Super Bowls and things like that, um, our partner to the north has been fully staffed and been able to really assist with a lot of those details. That is no longer the case. So we have to make sure that we have a plan in place to uh, secure this event should we get it. And I'm confident that we'll be able to do that because, again, there's some design things that we can put in place to make sure that 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 happen. But, yes, the federal government and our state partners will be assisting, I'm sure, for this. Thanks. Uh, so my questions, um, um, to the extent you possibly can, c- first off, confirmation, these numbers that you gave us uh, were arrests? Is that? For, yeah, which ones are you talking about? Well, generally. Yes. So, right? Yeah. Um, do you ha- are you tracking recidivism at all, um, people that you've arrested multiple times? We are not tracking that. Uh, we don't have the capability to do that at this time. Yep. Yeah. okay. Um, and I don't know if this is maybe a question for the city manager for our attorney as well. I'm curious about whether or not, um, I mean, arrests and convictions are two different things, right? And so I'm kind of curious whether or not we have, um, at least for the con- criminal division that we are responsible for, what what are we seeing trend-wise in terms of convictions um, against what may it, may it had been trending before. Um, I, I know that um, we we depend on Hennepin County for a lot of these uh, prosecutions, and so I'm, I'm just, maybe I should say prosecutions and not convictions because that's not necessarily up to any of us. Uh, but I'm curious as to whether or not we have any similar mappings or if it's a reverse, uh, what's the right thing? Um, I can't remember what you call it, but if, if the arrests are going up, it, are the are the you know prosecutions and convictions going up accordingly? I guess is my question. Mm-hmm. Thanks, uh, acting mayor members. We track a lot of data in our uh, through our case management system. I can tell you, generally speaking, our case numbers are up. Uh, our excuse me have returned to twenty to pre COVID times. Uh, they were down during COVID. They have returned. Uh, I can say that we also have. Uh, somewhat of a somewhat of an ability to track um, repeaters um, in that um, certain types of cases are enhanceable based on priors and so we can track for example to some extent with some caveats um, domestics repeat domestics um, what we do also have to acknowledge though is sort of the distribution of what we do uh, what we do prosecute um, r- compared to the county so the county prosecutes felonies we prosecute the other stuff. And so oftentimes um, there will be a misdemeanor that is sort of lumped in with a felony. Uh, So that travels with the felony. So in some ways the data is kind of, there's a lot of sort of asterisks on the data. Um, We also track, for example, victim letters. Um, Our office sends victim letters based on the types of crimes that come out of our office that we prosecute. And so in some ways we track the number of victims year over year. Uh, so we have different types of data points and and you'll see those in our budget memos um, in that every every year we provide a couple of years worth of data on many, many, many different types of um, statistics. If there's something in particular that you're interested in, um, we can try to get at that data through our available case management system. Um, but uh, when, um, when the chief talks about crime being down, uh, it, it's different for us because the distribution of, of cases. Uh, one thing I'll add, one last thing I'll add, is that the court sends out uh, an annual statistical overview um, of cases and, comp- um, and you see our, our distribution in various categories um, and it is for all of Hennepin County. So I can certainly pass that along if you're interested in that as well so that you can see that information. It comes out every year. It just came out a couple of months ago. 
uh, weeks ago, actually. And then there's also things like a domestic fatality review and things like that. There are task force that have different types of data subsets. Thank you. One quick follow-up, if I can. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, I thought I, I wasn't sure whether or not we were capable of, of – um, correlating the fine work of the police department and the fine work of the cr criminal division as a as kind of partners in in kind of maintaining not only the the um lower crime rates in general but can you correlate that there's because we're doing well from a prosecution and conviction perspective that's also contributing for example to um the reputation we have that you know you shouldn't come here uh if you're interested in criming if you will. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I didn't know if that was possible. If it is possible, I'd love to see it. But if it's not possible, I totally understand. Well, we're certainly linked with the police department. Um, <laughs> things are uh, sort of very much related with each other. Um, <laughs> I talked to Booker more than almost anybody else. Um, uh, and uh, <laughs> Except for your husband. Not yeah. that to me now. <laughs> I meant staff. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, it, there's just a lot going on, right? We're, we're the largest suburban city in Hennepin County. Um, we are a very large city in the metro. Um, that said, um, we, um, we have uh, values, certain prosecution values. Um, one, for example, is that we want people to get valid, for example, if they do not have a driver's license um, or you know other sort of qualifying criteria for them to have a driver's license. And so we may have multiple additional appearances um, trying to get them valid um, so that they can go back and do what they need to do in their life. Uh, so um, cities take different positions on how they prosecute crimes um, and and we have our set of values as well. So um, that sort of bears out and it's also informs us uh, in how we uh, partner with other uh, justice partners. For example, we have restorative court. We prosecute cases through our restorative court when we can, um, similarly through our diversion programs. Uh, the last thing I'll add is that we too have a, a social worker that is paid in part by Hennepin County um, that helps us staff our uh, social, or excuse me, our restorative court, uh, and um, the you know we hear from them uh, that they're very very busy. So uh, it's working, um, and you know I suspect that'll be a part of the upcoming budget materials. <laughs> so um, these things, these social workers, these embedded um, ideas, um, they are oftentimes staff intensive so that you can get to what is actually causing the situation. And yeah, I know um, Ms. Coleman and the HRA deals with that kind of too. What is giving rise to the circumstances that's led to their arrest and prosecution? Can, oh. uh, acting Mayor, if I may, I just want to clarify, Councilmember D'Alessandro asked a question about the data. I don't know if it was specific to the arrest slide that Chief was showing or just the numbers overall. I just want to clarify, the crimes reported is the just the number of reports that we get, right? It doesn't necessarily include arrests or... Yes. Yeah. Yep, Correct. okay. Yep. I just want to make sure that was clear for everyone. Yep. Councilmember Mua. Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor, um, and thank you, Chief, for all the work that you've done in your leadership with our police department. I know when we first met, I, I, I was really interested in how we bring public into public safety, right? Because it's not just the police's job to ensure the safety of the public. And I know you have a lot of different programs that reach out and do engagement and, and meet people where they're at and be more proactive versus reacting to issues when they, they occur. Can you give us an update on some of those programs, any highlights or anything so far? Um, I'd love to hear that. I think that's a, a good positive that we have going on here in the city. Yeah, so our crime prevention unit is very active um, in the community. And one thing that I like to point to, and I know sometimes um, you know, it's not a population that people – highlight often but our our elderly population and uh we do a lot of outreach and events at creekside and there's a reason for that um a lot of times you know a lot of these folks have um lived an entire life and they just want to be safe and they just want to have a connection um with their community so that's very important for us to go over there and spend time um with those folks um me personally i'm all over the place um you know i go to Dara Farouk. I, I'm, I'm all over the place in, in the community as well as our officers. But um, we have a youth academy coming up here this summer, which is the first time we've ever done one of those. But 
if you ask my officers, their opinion might be a little bit different than mine in terms of the one that I would point to. But for me, it's the work we're able to do with, with our seniors. Any additional questions or comments? Councilmember Lohman. Just one last thing. You had mentioned during your presentation uh, that in the, in the out years, as we get further along, that uh, you, we're going to run into some issues uh, with staffing. And I, I know that with the fire department, uh, you know, we, we had that happen um, where you saw you had just whole waves of, of folks coming up. Is that something that we're, we're seeing where we've got, you know, large numbers like 20, 15, uh, you know, year after year that are going to be retiring uh, coming up here in the next years? And, and I, I would ask what types of strategies would you suggest that we or to get ourselves prepared uh, for something like of that magnitude? So here in Bloomington, um, just give you an example. Last year we had 12 people retire, so that's about 10% of the workforce for our officers. Um, we will have a few retirements over the next few years, but our next big wave does not come until about four or five years from now, and that's when you're going to be in that 10% chunk. Um, then the next big wave after that is five years, and that's when I'm leaving, and that wave, <laughs> that wave is about um, – 30 officers. So in the next, you know, that's when our wave really hits. So what are we doing for that right now? We're continuing to invest in our cadet programs, uh, in our pathways programs, and continue to actively uh, recruit um, for those folks. And that's why I think you see a lot of people asking uh, the legislature for funding, because uh, there, there's a funding piece to this that the city just doesn't have the dollars to do with recruitment and being able to offer education programs that we're going to have to do. And that's, you know, right now, like I said, our, our partners to the north of Minneapolis, um, they're over 300 officers short. And I don't know how, I mean, they're going to fill those billets. I mean, once you get behind in hiring, it's hard to catch up. So that's what we're going to keep doing. That's why thank you all for allowing us to go from three cadets to six. <laughs> so that's and one of the things that we, we continue to do here is, is, to plan for that. And we are planning for that right now. Cause like I said, I, that's where our big chunk is going to come in at. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you, chief Hodges. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your leadership and you know, something that I've been thinking about through all this, I think about how you often say, you know, if you're going to do crime in Bloomington, we're going to catch you and we're going to arrest you mm -hmm. and um with some of these numbers i even think like they may have gone up but it's also because we are more aggressively more proactively addressing issues like you talked about human trafficking right and so um what was that DUIs. DUIs, DUIs, yes. is another great example and so um just yeah thank you for your leadership thank you for the vision that you've set for the police department and mm -hmm. the inspiration that you provide and the advocacy that you you do on behalf of the Bloomington Police Department all the time and yeah, your commitment to our community. Thank you. It's a big difference. And I'll just close on this. Um, this recruiting thing, we need everybody's help, right? So if you see a store clerk <laughs> that gives you good customer service, um, ask them if they think about being a police officer. Uh, the people that cut your hair, ask them if they think about being a police officer. We need help. And it's not just Bloomington. I said we're, we're fortunate where we're at. But a safe Minneapolis is good for all of us. So we need people to, to join this profession. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Our last agenda item is the city council policy and issue update. And so for our listening session this evening, we had one person come to speak to us, and his name is Tony Comer. And he he had come a couple months ago to talk about his concern about the lack of affordable home ownership opportunities, particularly for younger individuals. And so he came as kind of a follow-up conversation, um, was really uh, praising the different resources and support that we have for people who are looking to buy homes, um, but also gave us the feedback that our website could probably be easier to navigate, um, that he had, he felt like he had to kind of dig for them. Um, and so we have quite a few new home ownership uh, programs that people can look into. Um, again, he liked those. And then he also asked a question around um, how we're focusing on sustainable development. And so our HRA administrator, Erica Coleman, was there and provided some really good responses. Um, and then we close out the meeting. 
So with that, uh, Mr. Rubrigi, do you have any Thank you, Acting updates? Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I have one real-time update just from the meeting this evening on the performance measure question and the state program. So uh, I'm letting myself uh, off the hook a little bit in terms of not remembering the categories because there are actually 29. Oh, look, somebody's been Googling during the meeting. Uh -huh. So actually the state has... Um, measures set in uh, two, four, six different categories, general, police, fire, streets, water, and sewer. Uh, there are eight general measures, four police measures, seven fire measures, six streets, two water, two sewer. And so we have to report on 10 of those each year. So the most recent report that we submitted in 2022, we chose um, the change in uh, taxable market value. Uh, we chose police response time. Um, we chose our bond rating, uh, insurance industry, industry rating for the fire service, fire response time, fire calls per thousand population, average city street pavement uh, condition rating, average hours to complete road system uh, during snow events, the operating cost for a million gallons of water, and number of sewer blockages on the city system per 100 connections. Uh, what I can't tell you is if that's the same 10 that we've used each year. So we'll take a look and see if we've had any variation. Um, but like I said, we'll uh, we'll put last year's report into the packet uh, so that you can take a look at it. But that just so folks are wondering, that's what the program is. Yeah, yeah. The other uh, uh, update that I wanted to provide is just uh, uh, keeping an eye on what's happening at the legislature. Uh, we're in the last couple weeks, I believe. Mike is 19th the day that the, the 22nd is the day uh, that they uh, need to uh, adjourn by this year. And uh, most of the work is being done right now in conference committee and there's a fair amount of negotiation that's going on between the chairs uh, in uh, leadership as they're uh, trying to take their targets and put it into uh, final uh, language that they can get through. Uh, so we have uh, Katie Sen, our lobbyist, is uh, keeping track of things and uh, giving us regular updates. And uh, I don't have anything new to report other than uh, things are going to start moving here, I think, in the next couple days. Uh, one piece that hasn't been released yet is the bonding bill, which is something that we always uh, watch closely. Um, it's often described as being the glue that holds the, the legislature together, right? And so the bonding bill is usually the last thing that emerges. Um, and it seems to be that's the pattern that's being followed this year as well. So we'll keep the council updated as things proceed. Thank you, Mr. Fabri. Um, does anybody have any updates or issues? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, um, Acting Mayor. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to a couple of residents today, and um, and I know we haven't talked about it much here, but um, early earlier this year we embarked on a uh, strategic communications program survey update strategy thing, and um, it included uh, some of the work that we're doing right now around our social media um, uh, uh, policies, I guess I should say. Um, you know, some some residents have have uh, asked questions about um, how that's going, what will be the results of that, and I think we know a little bit more now. So I'm hoping that we can just give the public an update on how that is coming along. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, Council Members. Um, we have a broader strategic communications review that's being done, and uh, part of that is a review of our social media strategies. Uh, so we did make a decision, uh, I think the council member is uh, referencing recently, uh, to uh, disable commenting on the social media platform Facebook. Uh, the reason that we decided to do that was to gather data about how that affected um, uh, people's utilization of that platform. And uh, we're we're incorporating that into our overall evaluation. The strategic communications consultant that we're working with right now is endeavoring to be completed by early June with the uh, um, 
with the report, and then uh, we are planning to bring the count, the consultant before the council at the end of June or early July uh, to provide an overview of those findings and recommendations. So uh, about midsummer here, we should have a, a better sense of where we're going. But you know, when it comes to so that's strategic communications overall, but specific to the social media piece, um, what we've been looking at is how each of the different platforms uh, are working based on what we want them to accomplish, right? So do we use them to inform? Do we use them to facilitate conversation? Do we use them to engage? Do we use them to communicate? And so the manner in which we utilize each of those platforms will be based on what the objective is for having that platform. And that's part of what you'll see when, when we have the total picture come back for the council. So. Is it is it okay? Yeah, just a quick follow-up. That Thanks, uh, uh, City Manager. That is super helpful. Um, the, um, when you, will, will any of the recommendations, are they, do they include policy requirements? Like, are we gonna have something that we need to vote on? Or is this largely just staff implementation um, recommendations and, and we'd, we'd be in a inform only kind of situation? Uh, Acting Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, the fact that we're going to bring the report to you is that we'll want some feedback from the council. And so if there are things that rise to the level of council wanting to give direction, on how we do implement, uh, and there may be, I, I'm not prejudging the outcome of the evaluation yet because I haven't seen any of the draft recommendations just yet. Uh, if there are uh, issues that we frankly want the council to um, uh, especially answer questions about some of the recommendations, there'll be a role in doing that, yeah. Any other updates or issues? Councilmember Mayor, I've got a 20 minute, no, I'm just kidding. I've got nothing. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say just how wonderful you've done uh, this evening uh, so the rest of the public could, could hear that. Thank you for your uh, leadership tonight. Anybody else? Okay. Well, with that, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Meeting is adjourned.